Hello and welcome to the Megacast by Actual Tech Media. Today's topic, enhancing data protection, disaster recovery as a service, and disaster recovery capabilities. On this event, you'll hear from our experts from Rubrik, Synology, Clumio, Pure Storage, Druva, Kasten by Veeam, Duo, and Faction. What an awesome lineup of data protection and disaster recovery solutions. We've got some of the most innovative companies in the world today on the Megacast. If you have challenges around disaster recovery and protecting your data, you're in the right place. And I'd be willing to bet that just about every single IT organization out there in the world today is facing challenges. Challenges around security, challenges around disaster recovery, and challenges ensuring that you can recover from a ransomware attack. There I said it, the R word. I'm sure it won't be the first time that you'll hear it on the event today. Again, thank you so much to everyone out there in the Actual Tech Media audience for joining us on this Megacast event. Before we get started, I should mention my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'm glad to be serving as the moderator. We at Actual Tech Media created the Megacast event series to help educate IT professionals such as yourselves about the latest and greatest in enterprise technology to help you do it virtually and efficiently and from the comfort of your own home or office. And in the process, hey, why not win some awesome prizes as well? I'll cover those prizes here in just a moment. But first, I want to point out that we want this to be educational. We're all former IT professionals ourselves here at Actual Tech Media, and we want to help to solve your challenges around data protection and disaster recovery. I was an IT manager for many years. I went through the lengthy process of creating our disaster recovery plan, trying to justify that budget, setting RTOs and RPOs with executives, and then yes, testing that plan as well. I know how challenging that whole process is. So we encourage you to use the questions box there to ask our experts in this field your questions. We even have best question prizes to help encourage those questions. I'll even have some poll questions for you out there in the audience, and we appreciate your feedback on those. We also want this to be a social event. We encourage you socializing the event on Twitter, and you can do that directly from your audience console using the Twitter icon, and the hashtag for the Megacast will be automatically appended. And then we have some great resources there in the handouts tab, one from each of our experts. I encourage you to click on those, download those. There are special trial links. There are eBooks, solution briefs, a lot of great resources to help you to learn more about today's solutions. As I said, we've got some awesome prizes. This is a mega cast, and I like to say that we have a mega lineup of prizes. Today, it's five Surface Pro 8s. These are some amazing machines. And if that wasn't enough, we're giving out Amazon $500 gift cards after every presenter on the event today. Of course, you must be live in attendance to qualify. I will be verbally announcing those prize winners after each session. We also have our best question prize, one for each of the sessions on the event today. So when we get to Q&A, if you have a question on your mind, make sure that you ask it because that will be entered into our best question prize drawing. Of course, all winners must meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions. All grand prize winners must submit an IRS form W9 to actual tech media. And of course, you always have the option to make a donation to the charities that we've selected. We've donated thousands of dollars to charities over the years, thanks to generous prize winners such as yourselves. We've done that in partnership with the Gorilla Guide Book Club. You can download free educational IT books over at gorilla.guide. You can click on the link there in your handouts tab as well to the Gorilla Guide Book Club. These are completely free. They're enterprise IT books. They work on your Kindle, on your iPad, on your mobile device, and it's a great way to stay up to date on enterprise technology. And the Gorilla Guide books are actually really fun to read, so I encourage you to check those out. As I mentioned, the hashtag for today is ATM Megacast. I'll be following that over on Twitter. You can follow Actual Tech Media and me, your moderator, David M. Davis, as well over on Twitter. We're always talking about the latest and greatest in enterprise tech. You can also subscribe to all the Actual Tech Media social channels, YouTube, where we post recordings of all of our events, Facebook and the 10 on Tech podcast. And then, of course, we post our latest and greatest content on LinkedIn as well. So I encourage you to follow us there. Before I introduce you to our keynote presenter, I want to 
bring up one other way even to win a prize. Uh, that is our refer an IT friend or coworker to Actual Tech Media's online events. And both of you could win an Amazon $300 gift card. No, you don't have to split it. That's one gift card for you and one gift card for your IT friend. We will hold those prize drawings monthly and we promise not to spam your IT friends. We'll send them an invitation to join a list of events. If they don't respond, we'll send them one more reminder and then we won't bother them after that. You can find our event referral form there in the handouts tab or at the end of the event, you'll be automatically redirected to our event referral page. So thank you in advance for sharing what we do here at Actual Tech Media with your IT friends and coworkers. And with that, I'm excited to introduce you to today's keynote presenter on the Megacast. I'm really pleased to introduce you to Dave Kawula. He is the co-founder of MVP Days Publishing. He's an enterprise consultant, a technology evangelist, and a best-selling author. If, if you haven't seen Dave's content out there, I encourage you to check it out. You can follow Dave on Twitter, at Dave Kawula, on LinkedIn, and his blog is checkyourlogs.net. Dave, it's great to have you on. Take it away. All right, David, thank you for the very warm introduction. And let's get right into this, our five top issues in disaster recovery. Issue number one, ransomware. And the first thing you need to think about ransomware with disaster recovery and your backup operations plans is, will your traditional DR operation guide suffice when a threat actor is inside of your network? Currently, uh, maybe you've got a, an ongoing hack, you've got a breach somewhere. And one of the things that I really want you to think about is that you should have two separate DR and backup operations guides. You should have one that's based on some type of a cyber threat inside of your organization. And the other one probably already exists. It's your traditional DR plan where we're, we're facing the loss of power in a data center. You know, we've got the traditional um, natural disasters that are going on, uh, fire, flood, tornado, hurricane, forest fires lately, loss of a power grid, something like that. So really think about that and get yourself a separate operations guide because when you're under attack, that traditional plan and the way that we fail over and bring back VMs from a DR perspective is significantly different. All right, number two, the cascade effect. And you're thinking to yourself right now, What's the cascade effect? I've been in IT a long time and I've never even heard of the cascade effect. Well, good news. You didn't miss something. I've just recently come up with this to try to explain a very big problem with backup NDR environments. And let's take a, a quick scenario here. The scenario looks like this. You want to increase the size of a virtual hard disk from 500 gigs to one terabyte. Well, it seems like a simple enough request, right? But what it means for the backup and DR teams is a significant impact because as good DR and backup admins, they probably got a, a copy of that data on a primary backup target. Maybe they pushed it to an offsite backup target. So you're already at 2x that amount of space required. Maybe you've got a cloud backup target, maybe in mutable storage somewhere. And maybe you've got copies of that virtual machine replicated somewhere. So very quickly, that 500 gig request goes to upwards of you know one to two terabytes of backup and DR space that's required. And to make matters worse in the cloud, what ends up happening is capacity is not really an issue. Storage, cloud storage is not really an issue. So this really compounds the problem. So I really want you to think about the cascade effect and how this impacts your backup and DR teams. All right, issue number three. Um, backup performance target and backup target sizing is a huge issue in production today. Um, I find a lot of organizations like to rehab old equipment and they're, they're like, oh, well, we're just going to use this as our DR infrastructure. It's been running in production for five years. It should be good enough for DR. So one of the things I want you to take away here today is that DR is just as much production as production. If you undersize it and you underinvest in it, don't expect it to perform when you're going to have to hit that big red button and fail over. All right, number four, disaster recovery as a service. 
One of the biggest issues I've seen organizations face right now is uh, a lack of internal expertise to guide and run their DR projects. So one of the things I'd consider you, I'd, I'd have you consider is look at investing in DR as a service, one of the vendors that's out there that provides this, because this could provide you some extremely rapid onboarding. And my biggest concern for your organizations today is that you're left in some type of an unprotected state. You know, ransomware is hitting organizations faster than ever. You know, we, we had the giant Kaseya breach that, you know, was one of the largest ransomware payload deliveries in history. And if you were caught without some type of a disaster recovery plan or somewhere that you could fail over that virtual infrastructure, you are going to be left in very poor shape. All right, last one, number five. This is a really huge one. Um, dedicated fabric for backup networks and replica networks. This is huge because threat actors today consider backup and DR targets extremely high value artifacts when they're taking and they're, they're about to um, attack an organization. Because if they can take out your backups and your replicas, they're taking out all ways for you to take and be able to recover from said compromise. So what does this mean? It's very simple. I want you to consider for your backup infrastructure and your replicate infrastructure, a separate Active Directory force and domain, implement zero trust, implement multi-factor, and you can even consider moving your hypervisors to that environment as well. So with that, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. And David, the show is yours. Really excellent tips. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, wise advice and perfect to set up today's topic of enhancing data protection, DRAS, and disaster recovery capabilities. And speaking of which, I want to hear your feedback. What, what are you concerned about when it comes to disaster recovery and data protection challenges? I've just brought up our first poll of the event here. And the question is, which of these are your greatest challenges concerning data protection and disaster recovery? Uh, this is a multi-select question. Uh, you, you may have more than one challenge. It's likely that you do. So feel, feel free to select more than one option here on the poll. Um, what are you most concerned about? The confidence of your solution, justifying the budget to pay for it, RTO and RPO, is it going to meet the needs of your company and your critical applications? Uh, what about ease of use, just getting it implemented and using it on a day-to-day -day basis, administering it and monitoring it? Uh, perhaps compliance is a concern. Uh, what about the security of the data? Once it's backed up, uh, is it going to be secure? And then, of course, rapid recovery. If you're hit with a ransomware attack, can you get your data back? I guess that really kind of goes along with the, the RTO there. Um, and then maybe there's another challenge that's not listed here. This is a poll I came up with uh, just this morning, actually, uh, in preparing for this event. So perhaps I missed something. It's likely I did. If something's not on the list and you have a challenge, uh, drop it in the questions pane there, and I will share it with the audience. So I'll give everyone a moment to respond to this, and then I'll share the results of the poll here with you. Uh, let's see, uh, Jose said RTO and RPO uh, cost and easy to implement solution are his greatest challenges. Uh, Matt said split recovery of systems in both on-prem DR site and the expectation to recover a percentage to cloud IaaS. Absolutely a great, great challenge there I'm sure a lot of companies deal with is, you know, in recovery, it's, it's not always simple. Like one application, push a button, and it's back. Boom. No, it's really complicated. And we've got these interdependencies between applications and services, and then there's cloud and SaaS apps. All right, so thank you to everyone who responded to that poll. If we take a look here at the results, uh, the winner, if there is one, because it's a really a close tie, 43% said the security of the data. Uh, followed by lots of options here in the 30s, uh, really just kind of across the board a, a tie, 30-something uh, percent for each one of these. And then second poll before I introduce you to our first presenter on the Megacast. That is, you know, you've got challenges. Now, what's your time frame to take some action to add new 
data protection or DRAS solutions at your company, or if you already have solutions, most of you do, uh, to replace or augment those solutions with additional solutions related to data protection, DRAS, and disaster recovery. So I'll let everyone respond to this. And then uh, first presenter is in the green room getting ready to go. Uh, let's see, here's some more feedback about the greatest challenges. Uh, Stefan said, uh, staffing resources, absolutely. Uh, the staff required to implement these type of solutions or continue to, to uh, administer your current solutions. Uh, Chris said, if it's not secure, nothing else matters. Great feedback, thank you. Uh, well said, and, and that really kind of goes back to the, the winner there. If, if you want to call it a winner, the leader on the poll, which was securing the data. Uh, Justin said, can the solution fail back? It's not just the failover, it's the fail back that's important. Great point. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. You got to be able to fail back. Uh, Matt said, having a truly offline or air gap backup. Absolutely. Uh, Deepak said, uh, great sessions. Uh, thank you, Deepak. We appreciate that. Uh, interested in learning more about ransomware disaster recovery. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll questions. It's now time to kick off today's megacast with our first presenter. Welcome, Carl Norwich. Go to market lead for app flows at Rubric. Carl, take it away. Time today and. Uh... I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about uh, what Rubrik's done in our portfolio around disaster recovery. But uh, what we like, to, what I'd like to do first is, is that um, some of you folks may not have Rubrik today. Some of you may. So I think it's important to at least get kind of a foundation of what Rubrik does, where we came from, why we've been so successful, and obviously where we're going to be taking the product into the future. So you know, start out with that. Um, you know, we, we were born five years ago um, as, a, as a modernized backup uh, system or platform. Uh, we found tons of success over the years, uh, over 2,000 customers, um, well over uh, uh, right at 2,000 employees as well in just a short five years. And wh why did we have that success? So really we focused in on these three areas and have had a lot of success in doing so. First of all, automating data protection overall. overall. I'm sure I have backup administrators, uh, managers, even leaders and directors, and I think we can all agree is that traditionally how data protection was handled has been very manual. You essentially throw uh, full-time employees at it. It takes a lot of time, burden, and management. And what we've done effectively brought automation to that whole practice of meeting business objectives, SLAs and otherwise. The uh, second part of it is, is we can drive uh, automated recovery and rapid recovery from either, you know, just a normal user deleted a file, user broke a VM, user broke an Oracle database, all the way to we got hit by ransomware and how do we get our systems online as quickly as possible. And lastly, the whole foundation of the system is built upon an immutable file system or an immutable platform, if you will. Uh, that, that term is used and overused candidly a lot in the marketplace. So let me describe to you what I mean by that. Is that when we wrote our own file system as a part of the platform or the, or the rubric application stack, as you will, is that we wrote our own file system. And as a part of doing that, what we did is that we designed it so that there is no command, there is no utility, there is nothing within our file system that allows for an override of data meaning the data is locked in time. It's also known as an append-only file system. What that's meant to say is I write an object of data into the file system. I can no longer manipulate that data in any way. All I can do is append files to it, which means fundamentally we've created a logical work app within our platform, which means the data is always available for you, uh, regardless of the surrounding circumstances. So diving in a bit more, I'd mentioned automation. And we kind of got into it, is that if you think about how backup platforms or backup solutions, I should say, have been handled in the past, that's really been an approach of, you know, buy backup software, buy servers to support that, size it appropriately, buy disk, maybe buy a replication target, then hire an iron mountain, put it in a tape, and then put it in a salt mine. And we wanted to take all of those fundamentals and put them into one single scalable platform. And that's the fundamentally what Rubrik does. We give you the capability to deploy a single appliance or a single instance of our software, which is infinitely scalable, and it is everything. It's your backup system. It's your proxy. It's your it's, uh, your deduplication engine. It has native cloud archive capabilities. All these things are built into a single management point and a single point of scale for the business, which makes it much easier to understand. The second part is about accelerating recovery. So typically when you have to do a recovery, you have to pull data from disk, you have to go and restage it, you have to copy data from point A to point B. 
Um, and that's extremely challenging. I mean, that, that means that you have extended downtime for application owners, users, and for the, ultimately the business. So what we've done in, within our system is we give you the ability to turn the data on live directly off of our appliance and then migrate it. So you can do this with VMware, Hyper-V, AHV, SQL databases, Oracle databases, which gives you an RPO or recovery, or RTO, I should say, recovery time objective of minutes, not hours. Additionally, what we've done is we've integrated the ability to do search of your files, so you can do file level recovery, whether the data set be locally available on the appliance, whether it be in an S3 or a blob store, or whether it be at the replica DR rubric. So inherently, again, what we've done is we've tried to funnel and simplify the entire operational cadence of recovery in the same way that we've done protection. And then lastly, because of this, because you have one single point of management, because you have one single point um, of scale is that we've driven down the, the cost of backup, both in time of transition, meaning you move ahead of rubric today, how long your time is that you have your product online for, for producing business services, but also the ongoing costs. Because it is, is scalable, you, there's no forklift upgrades. There's none of the migration costs that you have associated with the traditional product. You, get in, you, you inherently are going to be saving costs not only in the, the fact that you only have to buy one solution, not three to four to five, but also on the fact that operationally, your operations team or you as the operators only have to manage one solution, not a variety of them. And we see in, in terms of real hard dollar costs that we're saving anywhere from our clients, anywhere from 30 to 50% on their backup solution existing today. And again, this is why the proof's in the pudding with, in terms of results. Rubric is what's known as a unicorn out of Silicon Valley, rated in the top five startups uh, by LinkedIn even most recently. We, these uh, data points that I'm providing you are real and have played out over the years that we've been in the marketplace. So that's the foundation of the company. So let's talk a little bit about what I specialize in. Um, I, I, my responsibility is to bring new products and offerings to market. So what we've brought to market is, is uh, orchestrated disaster recovery, leveraging and deriving more business services out of your backup. So the way to think about this is that what I just described to you a moment ago was very backup centric. We automate the ability to capture your data based on an SLA concept versus a job. We replicate your data and we maintain all of those SLAs and everything else. Everything that I just described a moment ago. But that's backup. What, how, how can we derive more business services or more business value out of those backups as opposed to having them sitting in their stale, uh, just waiting for something to go wrong? But the key is that at the end of the day, we are a software company and we are a SaaS company and that's our future. And really, that's the ability for us to drive forward additional business services without selling additional hardware or consuming more floor tile. And that's where our SaaS platform comes into place that we call Polaris. Now, you know, as, as users, it doesn't really matter much to you, but just so you know, there's a platform in the cloud that is rubric built, rubric certified, rubric hardened in terms of security that gives us an ability to add additional business, business services on top of the backups that you're already capturing today. A couple of examples of where we've done this is uh, rent, Ransomware recovery, remediation, and triage, and a product that we call Radar. What it does fundamentally is it watches your backup, learns your backups over time, learns their change rates through machine learning algorithms so that we can identify, A, have you been hit by a disgruntled employee or a ransomware attack? And secondarily, let's give you an easy-to-use tool that can help you fully triage what is the attack vectors, what business services have impacted, and how am I going to prioritize that recovery? And again, this happens as a consequence of a SaaS app that was added that's writing, if you will, on top of the backup data that we're already capturing day to day. Secondly, uh, data classification. Why not? What PII information, HIPAA information, depending upon what compliance uh, adherences that you have as a business. Instead of having a satellite solution, we've got all the data captured, we've got it all indexed. Why don't we provide you the ability to apply analyzers to those data sets and understand, is my data where I need it to be? Do the right users have access to it? and take remediation tests based on that information. So imagine being able to layer in data classification via a SaaS app without having to consume any additional on-premise hardware. And in that light, that's exactly how we intend to do disaster recovery as well. If you think about it, if we're already backing up your virtual environment on-premise, we're already replicating it for purposes of disaster recovery, why can't we layer in the instruction set and the orchestration required to give you business continuity or, or site failover? And that's exactly what we've done. We're allowing our backup product to do what it does best, capture data, maintain SLAs, maintain business compliance, replicate that data, and by a SaaS app, we've layered on all the orchestration instructions to move your applications or fail them over gracefully between sites. And a fundamental way to way think about it is we've decoupled the data movement process from the logic and the orchestration. 
Now, last thing, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. So the best part of SAS app or anybody who's an operator out there is that you don't no longer have to worry about code updates. You don't have to worry about doing change management. You don't have to worry about hot fixes. You don't have to worry about patch releases. All of that stuff is managed by us on our SaaS platform. You get to be a true consumer of a solution as opposed to both the on-premise manager and the consumer of the solution. So it really lightens the load from an operations perspective on how you, you, how you interact with the product or the, the um, solution. Great. So next, let's talk a little bit about the current state of disaster recovery. Um, when we brought this product to market, we went through a, a very lengthy process of interviewing customers who have products today. I've personally done four startups um, in the last 10 years or so, and in every case of those startups, we were going into what's called an incumbent space. What I mean by that is, is that there was already something there previous to us, but we believed that we could do it better and be transformative in that same area. So in this case, obviously, disaster recovery has been around for some time, so it was really important for us to understand what are the pain points around what's already out there? Because if we don't address those, we're not going to make it very far. So first of all, complexity was a theme with all of the legacy providers, both in ongoing operational management or runtime management, if you will, as well as just getting the solution stood up in the first place. So how can we lower the complexity, make the product much easier to use and much easier to get online so that you're, again, time to value. You write a check, and how quickly are we providing a business services? How, how much can we narrow that? So we put a lot of focus on, let's take the complexity out of disaster recovery. Secondly, the expense. Um, this is, I'll give you a compelling stat, is that most DR solutions aren't able to sell to more than 10 to 15% of any, any uh, client's uh, application stack. Why is that? Because of the cost. At the end of the day, you're only going to spend high dollar premiums on things that are most important to the business and rely upon manual intervention for everything else. So how can we drive down expense? so that you can afford to have DR orchestration for your entire data center and all of your applications, not just the most important ones. So there's a heavy focus there for us as well. And then lastly, uh, best of breed or siloed solutions. I mean, I think we would all agree that free rounds of golf and free lunches are nice for vendors, but at the end of the day, operationally, the less products that you have on your data center floor, the more efficient you're gonna be as an operations team and as an IT business. So obviously we brought disaster recovery into our portfolio, but what, but what we've also done is we've made a real effort to make it so that it, the way that you manage uploads is integral to the way you manage Rubrik today. Meaning if you're comfortable with managing Rubrik today, you're going to be comfortable managing this DR solution that has been added onto the portfolio, not a satellite solution in any way. All right, so that was a bit of preamble. Let's talk a bit about how it works. This is always the fun part. So first let's talk about vernacular. So in this market, you hear terms like runbook or a, a virtual protection group or something to that effect. Our equivalent is going to be what we call an application blueprint, or blueprint for short. So think of that as the logical container where you're going to say this set of VMs is representative of a particular application. It's also where you're going to tell us things such as the boot order. In which order do you want us to bring the VMs online on the DR side so the application comes online gracefully? What compute and storage would you like us to leverage on the DR side? Uh, what networking would you like us to apply to the VM so they settle in nicely into the DR uh, site's networking schema? Um, uh, what postscripts to run. And lastly, at the end of the day, we are a backup company at our core. So what SLA or what protect backup policy do you want us to automatically assign to these workloads as they fail over? Because uh, unfortunately for all of us, just because you have a DR event does not mean that we're not compliant to any kind of regulations and capturing data because we are producing at the end of the day production data. We're just doing it at our DR site. So we've automated this end to end. Now, what I would call out here is that the ease of use in setting up a blueprint and how it's in principle designed is that if you, as you notice in my, my list there, there isn't you setting up a replication schema. There isn't you setting up an RPO because all of that is being done by your backups because we're leveraging your backup data, consolidating the amount of data movements required from data center to data center, and again, deriving more value out of it. So what the blueprint is in net net is the orchestration instructions, but it has nothing to do with the data movement, which is already happening as a consequence of your backups. So very much simplifying the process of creating, maintaining these, and also driving reliability. Next, let's talk about RTOs, recovery time objectives. So we actually give you choice here, uh, a better best, if you will. We have a capability to give you an extremely low RTO, but maybe a little bit longer RTO, but has lower runtime costs. So let's talk through those very quickly. So first of all, let's talk about the, what we call incremental export or a standby option, if you will. 
So if you imagine on the left-hand side there, that's your production rubric cluster, backing up your virtual environment. As a reminder, and for those who aren't aware, we are an incremental forever system, meaning we take one full for the lifetime of the VM, and then it's an incremental for backup thereafter, so only the deltas. And that information is being uh, replicated to a DR rubric cluster. What the DR rubric cluster is going to do with this concept of the lowest RTO is we're going to stage a copy of each one of those VMs into a data store proactively. So the idea behind this is, is that let's get the data movement part of the equation handled proactively so that if I have an outage or I have a DR test, our RTO is going to be very low and very consistent because it doesn't require us to move any data. It simply is a matter of us applying networking schema, running postscripts, bringing them on in the right order and otherwise. So it's going to give you that very low and consistent RTO regardless of how big the VMs are. Now, we have an unfair advantage here, too, because, again, at the end of the day, we are a backup company. What I mean by that is, is that you can select from any recovery point available on that DR rubric cluster, and we'll simply rewind those images to the point in time that you've selected. So you get a lot. So if you start thinking bad code updates, uh, ransomware attacks, and otherwise, you're not stuck with that latest recovery point. Because it's sitting on an immutable file system, you can, you can rest easy knowing those recovery points are going to be available to you. <clears throat> But you get flexibility at the end of the day. Now, the other option that I mentioned was something that we call an on-demand export, if you will, which is going to have a longer RTO, but it, we feel like it has this purpose based on customer feedback. Same deal. I'm, rep I'm backing up on production. I'm replicating over to DR. The difference is, is that the DR rubric cluster is not going to copy that data into the data store until you have a DR event or a DR test. Now, you might ask yourself, why would I do that? Well, think about all those tier three and those tier four applications that you still need as a business, but they aren't business critical. And you have your bosses saying, why can't we retest some of that DR equipment for different purposes, maybe test DR, sandboxes and otherwise. So imagine being able to have more flexibility in how you leverage that DR equipment so it provides real-time business value. You have a DR event, you clear that space off, you hit a button, and the operations team gets the benefit of orchestration and the business gets the benefit of being able to retask some of that hardware for those lower tier applications. So it's all about assigning the right RTO to the value of the business, to the business service appropriately. So again, about flexibility. In terms of recovery points, this is driven by your backup, uh, your backup cadence, as I mentioned earlier. Now, however often you back up your data and replicate it are the recovery points that are available for app flows to use. But what I don't want to call out here is, again, flexibility is the theme. And a lot of the feedback that we've gotten from our clients is, well, modern apps are different. They don't require write fidelity. They're not uh, tightly coupled from a stack perspective. They're generally loosely coupled or disparate nowadays. Meaning, let's say I have a three-tier application, which is a web server, an app server, and then a database server tier, uh, tier. Well, my web server is largely static. I don't want to run continuous data protection against that VM. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's overkill. So let's maybe back it up, say, once a day. Secondly, my app tier, those are largely stateless nowadays. You know, you need to capture configuration changes, but there's no real data there to be lost. So let's back it up, say, every four to eight hours. And again, reminding you, it's an incremental forever system, so only the deltas are captured. Uh, but lastly, that database tier, where the information lives, where the transaction lives, where the business, uh, the, the value to business is living. Let's run continuous data protection against that tier. And all three of those VMs can coexist in the same blueprint. So when you go through to do a DR test or a DR event, the system will call out this variance and recovery points. And then you can make a decision, yes, I'm good with that variance, or you get an opportunity to dial them in a little bit closer. But again, the whole idea here is let's apply the right resource even to the right tier of the application as opposed to making it generically uniform across the entire app, wasting resources. All right, so let's talk about failover and fail back. So uh, failover is two clicks in the confirmation phrase. RTO, of course, is going to vary based on am I doing uh, that staging concept that I mentioned, incremental export, or am I doing it on demand? But really what I, where I want to focus in here is on the fail back. So how can we automate the fail back process? Most DR products are very good at getting one way, but they're not so good at getting back. So what we want to do is automate as much as we possibly could in regards to failing back. So if you remember, as part of that blueprint definition, you're assigning a, a backup schema to it, what we at Rubric call an SLA, or service level agreement. Now, it serves two purposes. The first purpose is, of course, to continue to back up the data as we fail over to DR so that we can maintain our business and compliance uh, requirements. But it also serves a second purpose. It is also can inverse replication either back to your production site or to a tertiary third site. 
So what that means is, is that as soon as the DR rubric cluster can either see its originating site or a third site, it's going to automatically start synchronizing your data back, uh, back to that site with zero operator intervention. So that means that once that data is synchronized, again, without you having to even touch a button, you can, your fail back is just an inverse of your failover, two clicks and a confirmation phrase. So what we've done here is automated every facet of not only the failover, but the fail back to make this as operationally easy to use as we possibly can. The second thing I call out here is what we've done from a storage efficiency perspective, because the goal of a product like mine where I'm saying I'm SaaS delivered is I don't want to have to sell you more hardware as a consequence of us being in the picture. So when we fail over between rubric clusters from production to DR and we reprotect, we know that we have that backup chain. And as I keep mentioning here, because it's an efficiency that's important in understanding our, our cores here, is that we're an incremental forever system. Because the backup chain has already been replicated to DR, when we reprotect those VMs, we know we have that backup chain and your incremental forever schema is gonna persist as your application is failing between sites. Making the rubric cut part of the equation in terms of storage is storage efficient as we possibly can be. So we've obviously put a lot of thought into how do we drive down costs and make this an easy to use solution layered on top of a, a state of the art backup solution or platform. And then lastly, um, thankfully for all of us, nine times out of 10, we're doing DR tests, not DR events. So of course the product can do DR testing and then we have complimentary compliance reporting that can be downloaded on a blueprint by blueprint basis. Talks about the steps we took, how long they took, timestamps, success and failure, participating VMs, and all the things that you would need to download, hand it to your, um, hand it to your boss or to your compliance officer and say, we are DR ready. So we're also trying to ease as much as we can the administrative burden of a DR solution as well in this, um, with this product. Great. So now that we've talked about that, let's talk about what's on top of everyone's mind nowadays, unfortunately, is ransomware attacks. So when we, like I've been um, working in uh, IT infrastructure for 20 years. And whenever I thought DR, I thought uh, tornado, flood, power outage, act of God, insert here. But I think we can all agree is that what's top of mind for everybody nowadays is ransomware. Like, well, how do I protect from it, which you have uh, different layers of security to protect yourself as much as possible. But if all of those layers are to, were to fail, because at the end of the day, we can't control what our users click on, unfortunately. What, how can we give you an ability not only to make sure your data is available for recovery so you don't have to pay the ransom, but most also, how do we automate that process so that you're back online as quickly as possible? So let's talk through that a bit. Again, what did the inevitable happen? So first, let's talk about Radar, I mentioned it lightly at the beginning. It's a ransomware remediation software that learns your data set, learns your trims via algorithms, so that we can see, if we see something out of the ordinary, we can alert you. So Radar by itself is a fantastic solution. It's one of our fastest growing products here at Rubrik. But now, why don't we make it even more intuitive? You've gone through the effort of defining your business services via those blueprints. So why don't we take advantage of that and make it easier for you to triage the attack? So instead of seeing a list of VMs, what you're gonna see is a list of your blueprints or a list of your business services. So it's much easier for you to understand which business services have been impacted as a consequence of this attack, which VMs are participating, so you can assess what are my next steps gonna be and how am I gonna prioritize. So that's number one, how do I identify the blast radius as quickly as possible? And we're leveraging the power of both radar and app flows to make this very easy to assess and understand. Second part is, is when, to which point do I want to recover? How do, what point do I have available to me prior to the encryption event that was closest to the event where I can minimize data loss and get my business back online? Well, great news. Radar is going to recommend a point in time to you recover to that was pre, the re, closest recovery point to that bad behavior. But we also, again, want to automate. How do we remove human error in a very chaotic time? So when you say, yes, I would like to recover this application, Radar is going to pre-populate those points and times into app flows so that you as an operator don't have to take information from one tool and manually input it into another, introducing the opportunity for human error. We're automating that aspect of it as well. And the last part of it is, is how do I recover? Well, so you have two different options here. Great news, first and foremost, is that app flow supports local recovery. So you get the option to do a local recovery, what we call in place, meaning that we'll go and rewind those VMs to the point in time you selected, We'll reboot them in the boot order that is prescribed in the blueprint and get that application back online gracefully and quickly at your local site. Now, depending upon what your InfoSec's response uh, process is, they may put yellow tape around your primary data center. Great news. Rubric cluster on the DR side is just as immutable and available as your primary site. 
So that means that you also have the flexibility to fail over to your DR site and run your business at the DR site while the FBI or whomever else is doing all the assessments at your production. But at the end of the day, what we want to do here is automate your ability to get information gather, make decisions quickly, and then act upon them as quickly as possible with the full amount of flexibility aligning to your business processes and business services. So that was my, uh, my quick dog and pony show. Hopefully I stayed well on time here. Um, our, our mantra here at Rubric is don't back up, go forward. I thank you all for your time, and I'm happy to field any questions that you may have. All right. Great presentation, Carl. Thank you so much. Um, we have just brought up a poll question for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the Rubric solution? And I'm afraid we're out of time for a uh, live Q&A with Carl. Uh, we got to keep the, the mega cast moving here and fast paced. Uh, but, uh, experts from Rubric, Rubric are answering questions electronically, and I can see there's a lot of uh, excitement here around the Rubric solution, lots of good questions coming in. So thank you for all the questions. We are routing those to our experts from Rubric as quickly as we can. So I'll give everyone a moment here to respond to the poll question on the screen. What additional information would you like about the Rubric solution? And while I do that, I will announce our first prize winner. We've got an Amazon $500 gift card going out to Lena Kumar from Utah. Congratulations. And hey, might as well go ahead and announce a grand prize for one of these uh, Microsoft Surface, what is it? It's a Microsoft Surface Pro 8, one of the awesome new services from Microsoft, the Surface Pro 8. Let's go ahead and announce one of those grand prize winners now. Uh, this one's going out to Dale Wallentine from Utah as well. Congratulations, both of our winners from Utah. But don't worry, lots more gift cards and grand prizes still on the event today. And thank you to everyone here who responded to the poll. And with that, it's now time for our next presentation on the Megacast today. I'm excited to bring in now Chris Alden, Senior Technical Account Manager at Synology. Chris, it's great to have you on. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us here today for our presentation on backup and recovery for Microsoft 365 and why it's important to protect your cloud services data. My name is Chris Alden, and I'm a Senior Technical Account Manager with Synology America. So if this is your first time hearing about Synology, let me just do a quick crash course for you. Now we were founded back in the year 2000 with the simple goal of creating a unified hardware and software experience for NAS devices. We wanted to make sure you could cover data storage, backup, and other functionalities such as virtualization and surveillance all within one platform. Now, because of this, our platform is designed to be highly configurable. Uh, when you first get one of these devices, it comes with just the bare necessities to run the NAS device. But then we have a package center, which is a veritable app store that offers well over 100 first and third party applications to tailor your device as you see fit. And I'll be talking about some of these applications here in this presentation. Now, let's jump right into the bulk of this. I wanna start off with a recent case study that we concluded with a large vocational college. Now, to start off with some information about them, they have over 18,000 current students and 1,000 faculty members. Now, each and every one of them have accounts on the Microsoft 365 platform. Taking everything into account, they had over 60,000 email addresses, 30,000 OneDrive accounts, and over 10,000 SharePoint sites. Now, this is quite a lot of data. Now, there are of course several reasons they opted for something like this. First is greater flexibility. Their M365 setup helped enable their remote work and learning capacities over the course of the pandemic, which of course, in turn meant that they were relying on it a lot more than they initially thought they might be. Now, as an institution, they have retention obligations that they need to meet as well. 
They must keep all of their current and former student data safe and secure for very long periods of time, sometimes indefinitely. Now, here's where they actually ran into an issue. Having data in the cloud does not guarantee that your data is safe and backed up. Let's take a look a little bit further into that. Now, if we actually open up the terms of a Microsoft 365 deployment, we can see that the responsibility for keeping all of your information, data, and accounts rests on you, the customer, solely. As a matter of fact, they even recommend that you regularly back up all of your content and data that you store on Microsoft 365 services utilizing other products. So this is very important to be keeping in mind. Now there are several reasons for this, of course, and the first is accidental deletion. An item that's deleted within Microsoft 365 will be removed permanently from the cloud after a period of 14 days. This means any accounts or data that are removed will become unretrievable after two weeks. And this poses an issue when you have legal guidelines to hold data for long periods of time. And managing large deployments, you might not even know some of these important things are missing within this two week window. Now second, if you have to recover large amounts of data quickly, you're really relying on your internet speeds to download everything back into place. Again, depending on the size of your data, this could very quickly prove to be untenable. Now lastly, any disconnections from the cloud can stop productivity in its tracks. Internet service outages mean that you no longer have access to your data, and with a switch to a lot of a remote workforce and remote learning capabilities, some people may not have the best internet and thus they can't access what they need to access. Now this college was able to solve all of these problems very simply by utilizing an on-premises backup device that took all of their various Microsoft 365 data and secured it on site. Now with an on-premises backup, they were satisfied their retention goals and covered themselves for their various compliance guidelines allowing for easy recovery in case of any issues. Secondly, they were able to reduce the IT overhead in managing their backups. They had a centralized setup and domain integration to cover the majority of the tasks, and their IT team could simply monitor a single device to make sure that their whole fleet was covered. Lastly, and very importantly for the school, is they were able to save tons of money in subscription and reoccurring licensing costs, by moving to this platform, which doesn't have any recurring fees for backing up or protecting your data at all. Now, they were able to accomplish all of this with active backup from Microsoft 365. This is one of our first party applications that's available for free download and use on any of our business class devices. This allows for local backups of all of your Microsoft 365 data, including OneDrive, SharePoint, and Exchange. And again, this is license free and it doesn't matter how large your deployment is, if it's 20,000 accounts or two accounts. Let's actually take a quick look at how we can back up our Microsoft 365 data locally to our Synology NAS. Now this is DSM, the operating system that comes with every Synology device. Now, if you're familiar with your computer, you'll most likely feel very familiar here. It's a very similar setup with our desktop, our applications on our left-hand side, and up here in the top left-hand corner is our main menu. Now, if I click on this, we'll see all of the applications I currently have installed on my NAS device. And in this case, we're going to open up Active Backup for Microsoft 365. Now, as is the case with a lot of our software, when you first open this up, you'll see the Overview tab, which will show you everything that this piece of software is currently doing. So here we can see our protected services, which we can see we have several drive accounts, mailboxes, and SharePoint sites being currently protected. Our backup summary here will indicate exactly how these backups are going. So we can see these green ones here indicate that we had completed successfully backups with no issues. We can see this yellow light down here uh, two weeks ago, which showed that something completed, but it had skipped some items. Now we can easily access this by clicking on it and then seeing exactly what the issue was. If we open this up, we'll actually get to our log here as well. And we can see that 
one of our sites actually failed this backup. And we can see why here. We can see that this was actually deleted and thus unable to complete that backup. Now by going back to the overview tab, I can scroll down and I can see activities, which would show us if any backups are currently happening. We can access our log directly here as well. And down here we can see our usage statistics. So here we have our service usage. We can see that our SharePoint sites take up the majority of this backup task. We can see exactly what's taking up how much. Here we can also see which tasks and which accounts are taking up the most of this backup. So we can see that all company, part of the M365 backup task, is using the majority of this space here. If we scroll down, we can see our transmission trends, which is mostly useful for larger organizations that have various tasks running, so they can compare them and see how much bandwidth is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now if I click here on the left-hand side for the task list, we can see the tasks that we have currently created. Now in order to create a new task, simply click Create, and then create a new backup task or relink to an existing one. Since I'm creating a new one, I'll click Next. And here I'd enter in all of my domain information. And here you can see I need to enter my Microsoft 365 admin credentials. Now, since I already have done this, I'm going to simply exit out of creating a new task and show you what it looks like to edit the one that we already have, since it's much the same. I'll click Edit, and for all intents and purposes, let's say we logged in with our admin account from Microsoft 365, and now we're creating this new task. So first, you want to create your task name. So here it's simply called M365 Backup, and it's going to our Active Backup for Business folder on our Synology NAS. If we go to the User tab, we can see all of the different users that we currently have here. But again, if we're a large organization, such as that school, over 20,000 users, we might be using groups instead. So here you can easily indicate which groups are gonna be part of this specific backup task that you're running. You can of course have different tasks for different groups and it's really simple to back them up. You simply click on any of these groups that you need and you can dictate exactly what it is you wanna be backing up from them. So potentially let's say I'm not interested in the archived mailboxes of any of them, I can simply subtract that from all of these backup tasks. Now here I can view all of the different sites that we have as well, and make sure that I'm having these backed up, or just exclude some of these from my backup task. Now the auto discovery service is particularly useful for large organizations. We could have a general backup task that's covering all of the new hires throughout our organization, or new students. So here, anytime we add a new user or a new group, or even a new site, we can make sure it automatically gets added to the task or maybe we're only interested in uh, new users that are being added. We can make sure that all of them get added directly to this backup task. Now here under policy is where we can start to get into the nitty gritty of this. So here you can have a manual backup, which I don't usually recommend. You could set up a scheduled backup to really any scheduling that you see fit. If this is going to run on particular days of the week or exactly how often this is going to run or when it will even start running. So for instance, we have this running at 3 a.m. every day, but we could also run this every hour on the hour and make sure that that's just running hourly backups for our Microsoft 365 accounts every single day. Now I can also do a continuous backup. Now again, depending on the size of your organization and your bandwidth, this may prove to be fairly useful. This means anytime you're editing anything within Microsoft 365, whether that's you're receiving an email to an inbox or you're changing a SharePoint site, you can make sure that those changes are automatically backed up as soon as they occur. Now, if we do that, we can hit OK here, and then we'll hit Save since we're modifying our task, and it'll make sure that it automatically does everything that it needs to do. Instead of running at 3 a.m., we're now backing up part of this continuous data backup task we can see that it's all running right here and the status is looking good. As soon as you set up a backup task and dictate it to a schedule, it will automatically execute at the next time that you dictate. So really, it's designed to be a kind of set it and forget it solution. Now this software also has several different recovery options as well. You can either restore entire groups or accounts, 
or utilize very granular restoration and grab single files or emails. You can restore it directly into its original place or export it for easy access. And you can also allow your users access to recover their own data as well, all in the interest of kind of reducing the amount of tickets that IT teams may be receiving for some of these simple self-service needs. Now, we've done a very great job of securing our Microsoft 365 data, but there's a potential issue to spot here. Let's say our primary site here were to experience an issue, such as a hardware failure or a natural disaster of some sort. All of this data we worked hard to secure would then potentially be lost or at high risk. We can easily alleviate this issue with a secondary offsite backup. We can accomplish this through another piece of license-free software that we offer called Snapshot Replication. And this will allow us to take a snapshot of our backup data on any schedule that we see fit as frequently as every five minutes. This snapshot is read only, so it can't be written over, which is very important when it comes to things such as ransomware. And it allows us to almost instantly recover our systems exactly as they were at the time of the snapshot. Lastly, by using smart retention policies, you can make sure that older snapshots that might not prove useful for your organization anymore are freed up, maintaining a smaller data footprint on your NAS device. Let's take a look at how we can configure a snapshot and some offsite replication really quickly. So here we are back in DSM, and this time we're going to go up to the main menu here and we're going to open up snapshot replication. Now here again, we can see exactly what our snapshot replication is doing. We can see what is scheduled for replication and what doesn't have any snapshots at all. So here, in order to protect our data or get started with it, we'll want to click on the snapshots tab here on the left hand side. Now our active backup for business data, this is the data that we currently have our Microsoft 365 data backed up into. So here, I'll click on this and I'll click on settings. Here we can enable a snapshot schedule. So again, we can run this at any times that we see fit, whether this is particular days of the week or every hour on the hour. You can actually go very frequent with this as well. If we go to more options here, I can run this as frequently as every five minutes, which makes sure that in case something does happen in our organization, ideally we're only losing five minutes of data. So here I'm going to go back and we'll just say every hour on the hour looks good. Click on the retention tab. And you can change this again to really anything that you might need. So right now we're keeping the last 128 hours backed up, but you can of course change to an advanced retention policy and get really granular with how you're designing this. So there's tons of different options for you. Let's say this looks good and hit okay. Then I'll click okay once more and it will automatically save and we can rest assured that now this will start snapshotting this data on the schedule that we see fit. So now the secondary part is sending this to an offsite location. So for that, we're going to click on the replication tab here. Now here I can click on the active backup for business folder and I can create a new task. I'll click start and I want to send this to a remote location. So I'll click next. And then I simply enter the server name or the IP address that we're looking for. So right now I'm going to quickly enter in all of the credentials that I have for another offsite location that we can send this over to. Now once we do that, we dictate which volume we want to enter this into. And here we have two different volumes, so I'll click next. And we want to select exactly what folder we want to be sending this over to. So for instance, this active backup for business folder that has all of this M365 data, click next. And then here we can dictate if we want to send the initial copy over the network or send an initial copy over using a storage device, which I'll actually talk about a little bit here in a moment. So here, since this is a pretty small amount of data, we can send this over the network. We'll click next. And then again, we enter our replication schedule. Uh, we can even send snapshots just within a specific window. So if we want to make sure that this is only going to be sending during off hours, maybe we can block out all of the time that people are going to be in the office, just so that bandwidth doesn't get taken up by this task. Here we'll click OK. Then I'll click Next once more. And then we'll hit Done. And we can see that this task is going to automatically set up and we can see exactly where it's going. 
Now there's one other thing I would like to discuss here about this replication task, and that is the initial replication. Let's say we have a modest amount of data that we're backing up at our primary site, like 10 terabytes or so. We have our secondary site set up, but it's in a totally different part of town or state, or maybe it's even out of the country. Now, these two devices are connected over an average internet connection, around 20 megabytes per second. That means this 10 terabyte replication task could take up to 45 days to accomplish. Now, waiting a month and a half is not ideal, and frankly, it's not really acceptable in most situations. So there's multiple ways that we can accomplish this initial task. You can have your secondary set of drives back up the data directly on site, and then ship them safely over to the secondary site. Then, once your second unit has its drives in place, you can simply link the replication task between the two devices, and it will, from that point onwards, only do the much more easily transmissible incremental changes over the internet, making sure that you have an exact one-to-one -one copy of the data at both locations. Now, the last thing I really want to discuss here is how you can choose the correct hardware for your backup task. I always start off with a series of questions designed to tailor your device for you by simply having the answers. First, we need to know the amount of data that you need to back up. Now, within the Microsoft 365 administration console, you can easily pull up all of your data usage statistics for all facets of your M365 deployment. Simply tally these all up and you'll have a pretty accurate estimate on what kind of storage space you'll be needing for your on-premises device. Secondly, it's also important to keep track of all of the daily changes to your data. Now, if your team is bringing in large amounts of data occasionally for big work projects, that could be something to account for. Otherwise, you might just see data growing slowly but steadily through normal use, such as new accounts, emails, and sites you can pretty simply calculate a percentage change and configure that into what you're looking for for your on-prem device. You need to have an idea of your retention requirements as well. Now, certain pieces of data across different industries are required to be retained for very long periods of times, uh, sometimes 10 years, sometimes indefinitely. So making sure that you have room for those is always something to keep top of mind, of course, as well. Lastly, Get a rough estimate on your future needs. Ideally, you don't want to be swapping out your hardware every year, and you want to construct a device that has room to grow into over the next three to five years of business usage. If that estimate is hard to come up with because your projects and work are always expanding, you can make sure that you're choosing hardware that can expand out pretty far for your potential needs down the line. On our website, we have pages dedicated to exactly how you can pull your current data usage information from the M365 platform that I highly recommend you take a look at if you're considering on-premises backup of all of this data. Well, thank you very much for your time here today, and we will actually be taking some questions now. All right, great presentation. Thank you so much, Chris. We do have some questions for you while we take those questions. I've just brought up a poll question for everyone out there in the audience. Uh, the poll is, uh, what additional information would you like about the Synology solution? Well, that was a really cool demo. We got some great feedback as well uh, on the demo from the audience. So thank you for doing that, Chris. Uh, first question I want to ask you, yeah, yeah. First question I want to ask you here is from Jeffrey. Uh, they're asking, or he's asking, will this automatically back up team sites as people add new sites? Uh, yes, if you set up that auto discovery service that we uh, looked at, then it will uh, automatically add them. Nice. That's cool. And then so it will, I mean, another question here was, will this back up teams? And of course the answer is yes to that, um, because if it adds new sites as they're created, then yes, it's backing up teams. Um, yep, anything exactly. else we need to know about the teams backup? Um, I always just kind of like to highlight there that you can back up teams and you can also kind of uh, protect any of the data that you might be storing in OneDrive for business and SharePoint online as well. It seems like we always kind of get those questions hand in hand, so I always like to underline that. 
Yeah, that's a great point because Teams isn't just like one thing. It uses, like you mentioned, these other you know Microsoft services as well to kind of complete the solution. So you need to protect those. It's good to know that exactly. those are covered. Yeah. Um, next question here. You might have heard this one before. Uh, what technology NAS model should I use? So that's um, that's a bit of a tricky kind of question, but we do we do really just suggest any kind of our of our modern ones that are using uh, the Disk Station Manager 6.1 and above. Uh, that way, you have access to uh, the full BTRFS, which allows you to do snapshots and kind of access all of the software that we spoke about here today. But for the NAS model, we do have kind of a um, way on our website that you can put in what it is you're looking for, and it'll give you a few options. And then additionally, that's pretty much my entire job, is making sure that people are getting uh, exactly what they need when it comes to when it comes to selecting their NASs. So I, I provide demos, I provide builds. Uh, you can always reach out to us through sac underscore sales at synology.com. Nice. Yeah, you all have many different models. Uh, there's a model out there for everyone. I've got a Synology now sitting right here next to me uh, on, on the desk. So um, great, great <laughs> good, options. Good. Yeah, great options for everyone out there, no matter the size of your business or data. Um, another question here that came in, they're asking, uh, what Microsoft 365 plans does this work with? Oh, great question. So that works with the uh, business plan, enterprise, the education plan, and uh, exchange online plans. Nice. Nice. And then um, this is an interesting question here from uh, Justin. Uh, do you have any hardening guides to secure the NAS? Any recommendations around securing the data that's on the NAS? So we do have uh, several guides on our website that kind of go through exactly how you can uh, encrypt all the data and uh, make it fall under kind of various guidelines there. We offer up to AES-256 encryption, so there's definitely lots of options there for, uh, for exactly what you need. And we have guides for kind of various ways to be doing that. Nice. And is there any limit on the number of accounts that this can protect? Um, no, but honestly, we always kind of recommend if you're backing up more than 500 accounts that you just reach out to us for kind of a consultation uh, just to make sure you're getting the right unit and making sure that, you know, it's going to be able to cover cover your kind of deployment there. Um, typically, we, we say around the 500 mark is when you should be reaching out just to have us double check. Yeah, absolutely. Great advice. Uh, Matt said that Synology has some rock solid stuff. Uh, always great to hear that from the audience. More fans out there. Um, so, always good, always good. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, I guess last question, if folks want to get started with Synology, you know, what do you recommend? So, if you want to get started, um, honestly, there's there's a lot of kind of like baseline units. The uh, Something like the DS220 Plus, uh, anything plus series and above can utilize any of the software that we spoke about here today. Um, and it's a pretty cheap entry point to kind of get you covered and protect like your family's computers, things of that nature, make a file server for kind of all of your family photos or videos. Uh, and then if you're like me, kind of, you know, you start there and you, you start getting a little bit more into it and then you end up with end up with a lot more of these devices in your home than uh, <laughs> anybody would have predicted, I guess. But yeah, that's um, you can always kind of start there with like a two-bay unit. It'll cover everything that we spoke about here today. And then uh, for businesses, again, feel free to reach out to us and we'll make sure you're at a good starting point as well. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. There's some more technical questions there for you in the queue. But a great presentation, Chris. Thank you for being on the Megacast. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Have a good one. And, of course, uh, I encourage everyone to check out the handouts tab as well. Uh, it's there that you'll find the Synology Solution Guide, which goes into uh, a lot of different uh, features and uh, sizing for the Synology uh, storage systems. So make sure that you download that before you go. And with that, I'll announce our next prize winner. We have an Amazon $500 gift card, this one going to Kale Sanders from Minnesota. Congratulations. 
And with that, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to the next presenter on today's Megacast. Welcome, Nick Hernandez, Cloud Systems Engineer at Clumio. Nick, take it away. Enhancing Data Protection, DRAS, and Disaster Recovery with Clumio. I am Nick Hernandez, one of the Cloud SEs here at Clumio. Today I will provide an overview of why Clumio is a valuable tool for ensuring your data can easily be recovered in the event a disaster strikes your cloud infrastructure. We should always remember AWS's shared responsibility model and have a disaster recovery plan, just in case. We'll start with an overview of why Clumio decided to enter the cloud data protection space, what we have brought to market so far, our core products, and then put some focus to why Clumio should be part of your disaster recovery strategy. As more and more customers are moving large amounts of mission critical data to the cloud, we found that data protection in the cloud is broken. There really is no ransomware protection. Responsibility falls on the customer's shoulders to ensure they are protected and able to recover from a ransom event or other disasters. There are features like snapshots to start the basis of a data protection strategy, but there are no insights to easily show you what is protected, where it exists, are you meeting data compliance requirements, and how much are snapshots costing you? When a catastrophic event hits, restores are slow. It is difficult to find the data you'd like to restore, and it is very slow to reproduce a file, directory, or a database record that you urgently need to get back into production. To build a solution that is highly secure and meets compliance requirements can be very, very costly as well. Enter Clumio. Clumio is a cloud-native SaaS data protection and recovery platform built in the cloud currently focused on protecting data which resides in AWS and in the not-too-distant future, Azure and GCP. We can restore a single file, multiple directories, or database records via easy-to-use global search and restore features. Every backup is air-gapped to Clumio outside of your cloud account so you can get to the data easily in the event of a disaster. Our support team manages the entire backup flow for you and in a proactive model where you never have to troubleshoot why a backup did not complete. And we deliver this in a SaaS model where you do not need to worry about hardware or software. Plus, there is a great chance we will lower your costs versus what you are doing natively with AWS backups today. Clumio has produced a ton of features in a short amount of time. In 2019, we GA'd the product for VMware Cloud on AWS and the industry's first AWS EBS protection service. We also embarked on achieving a number of industry security and compliance certifications like HIPAA, PCI DSS, ISO 27001, and SOC 2 Type 1. In 2020, we added RDS and EC2 level protection to our AWS Protect service, plus started supporting AWS Outpost backups. Continuing on our compliance journey, we achieved our SOC 2 Type 2. This year, we have kept innovating by introducing Clumio Discover, the industry's first insights and visualization tool that shows you how you are managing data protection in your AWS accounts. Currently free to use, it is available for download in the AWS Marketplace. For compliance, this year we have achieved our ISO 27701. These are just the big boulder items, but we have achieved a number of platform improvements which make Clumio easier to use and build reports out of as well. The core of our SaaS data protection service is Clumio Protect. Through Protect, we enable companies to air gap protect their mission critical AWS assets and M365. It is all done as a service with no hardware or software for you to manage. Data recovery is very fast, and we help you with advanced reporting to meet any audits that pertain to your data protection and recovery. Clumio Protect becomes your hub for both backups and restores, and enables you to define what regions you want your backups to go to, and in the event of a disaster, define which regions and accounts you want to restore data to. Clumio Discover was added to bring additional visibility to your use of data in AWS, how you are protecting this data, and at what cost. If you are struggling with visibility into your data strategy, we pull it all together for you in one single pane of glass. To build a disaster recovery plan, you need to know where your mission critical assets reside, if they are protected, and where you can actually do recoveries. Discover can give you valuable insights which allow you to determine if you can actually recover when you need to. Clumio availability brings the capability for out of region backups and recoveries. You determine where you want your backups to go. You are not locked into appliances in a specific account which define where your backups flow to. When a catastrophic event hits, you may need to restore services in another account and region. Availability enables this flexibility. 
Let's dig a bit deeper into Clima Protect as it is the core part of our service that enables you to not only have secure air gap backups, but to also restore data when a disaster strikes. In a standard AWS strategy, a customer creates AWS snapshots of their assets and they reside in the same account with these assets. Great for basic operational recovery, but not exactly air gapped nor made available for recovery outside of your production account. To achieve air gap backups, which can be recovered somewhere else, your snapshots would need to be copied to a second AWS account in another region. You will also need to make sure that this account and snapshots are highly secure and not overridable by a bad actor. When a disaster strikes, you must recover in that exact account and region. There is no flexibility to recover to any other region that you may want to. This is a good strategy, but it can be expensive and you do not gain any flexibility when it comes to disaster recovery. Plus, customers who have taken the DIY approach and built this on their own complain that it is very complex to manage. Let's look at how Clumio Protect works. Each and every backup is encrypted and then transferred to a customer's air-gapped Clumio Secure Vault. Backups land in immutable storage in a region defined by the customer. Again, this is 100% SaaS, so you're not building anything in your accounts at all. This is all 100% managed by Clumio. You automatically get secure backups outside of your accounts. You also get a full backup catalog plus file level indexing, which allows you to restore data all the way down to the file or database record granularity. So when you are not in the middle of a disaster, you can perform operational recoveries at various levels of granularity. To get all this happening, all you do is connect your AWS accounts to Clumio and start protecting your data. Let's dig deeper into disaster recovery in the public cloud. DR in the public cloud depends on a shared responsibility model. The public cloud provides service uptime and data resilience, but do you have your application designed for cross-account region availability and recovery? Do you have your data available in other regions just in case? If data is compromised by an internal or external bad actor, can you recover from your protected data? Let's look at disaster recovery profiles in the cloud. You are at high risk if you are simply creating snapshots of your data and storing the snapshots in the same account alongside your production data. You can recover from a deleted instance, but there is no opportunity to recover in a completely different account nor region. You decrease risk if you copy your snapshots to a second account in another region and you can recover within the account and region where the replicated snapshots reside. But what if you cannot or do not want to recover there? Plus, this is a costly approach as you are duplicating your snapshot cost and paying high data transfer rates. With Clumio, we become the hub for your backups to be restored to any account or region you want to restore to. You back up once, eliminating the need for a second set of costly snapshots in another account or region. On top of this, Clumio manages the entire backup and recovery workflow for you. So how does all this work with Clumio? How do we enable flexible recovery? Clumio's cloud-native architecture enables our customers to back up their mission-critical cloud services to any account or region, and when required by a disaster or something less catastrophic, to restore into any account or regions they need to. A control plane manages when backups occur and where they will be sent. There is no dependence on any local account or region infrastructure for your backups to occur. A separate data plane easily allows data to be backed up to the Clumio Secure Vault in the region of your choice. When a restore is required, the control plane is notified, the data to be restored is found in the Clumio Secure Vault it was sent to, and you define which account in which region you want the data to be restored to. If you want to automate this process, Clumio offers a robust API to plug into your recovery workflows. In a disaster scenario where you need to quickly get your applications and services up and running in a different region, you simply tell Clumio where you want the data to go. No need to overthink it or have a freak out moment at all. Now that we have discussed why it is important to have a highly secure, encrypted, and air gap backups which can be restored to anywhere you want, let's chat about all the restore options Clumio brings to the table. Clumio can restore a full EC2 or RDS instance when you need to. The instance can be restored to any AWS account or region you need. If an account or region is unusable, simply restore your instances to a different account in another region. In some cases, customers do not want to restore the entire instance, but maybe specific files, directories, or databases. In this case, Clumio enables you to utilize keyword search for the files, directories, or database records that you need to recover to a newly created instance. 
For RDS, we have a very slick RDS schema browser that allows you to scan through the databases and tables that have been protected to Clumio. Rather than restore the entire database, you can initiate record retrievals via SQL queries which locate the exact tables or records you need to recover. Any one of these restore types is done with just a few clicks in the Clumio interface, and restores are completed within a matter of just minutes. When a disaster strikes, you have to consider the process of recovery. Do you have time to comb through multiple snapshots across multiple consoles to find exactly what you need? Clumio aggregates all your backups across time in a very simple calendar, which allows you to click on a date and initiate a restore job. Simply select a date and the backup you want within that date, and with just a few clicks, restore a file, directory, or complete instance to target account of your choice. Time is of the essence when it comes to recovery, and we have developed a very simple and fast recovery process for you. Aside from backup and recovery, the next most important information you have is knowing you have a good backup that will enable you to recover when a disaster hits. From the same dashboard you create your backups and restores, we also provide you customizable global compliance reporting. These compliance reports are also great to produce when an internal or external auditor wants you to show them a track record of good backups. When an auditor asks you to prove that you have backups of your AWS assets, you can generate reports that show you what is meeting compliance and what is not. Most importantly, we show you the details as to why you're out of compliance so you can correct issues and get back into compliance. No longer do you have to comb through different dashboards and piece together details so you can build a do-it-yourself report consumable by an auditor. When it comes to recovering your data amidst a disaster, Clumio has what we consider to be the best recovery product on the market. Clumio allows you to send your backups to your preferred recovery region, and when you need to restore, you can recover to any region you want. We provide you all the reporting you need to make sure your backups are good and available when you need them via easy to consume reporting. We give you many options when it comes to recovery, and we can recover in minutes, not hours. You can easily build protection policies that can be applied across all your AWS accounts from one single Clumio console. We're also a true SaaS platform, so any problem that arises is handled proactively by our support team. When it comes to building an equivalent solution yourself, we will likely save you up to 50% by using Clumio instead. All of this is easy to use and deploy via the AWS Marketplace. Clumio Discover is free of charge, and every new onboarded customer receives a month worth of credits for Clumio Protect. Let's take a couple minutes to see Clumio in action. Clumio enables you to quickly connect and view all of your AWS accounts from one single pane of glass. I see the connection status of my accounts for our free Discover service and our Pay As You Consume Protect service. If I select Go to Discover, I access the Discover dashboard, which shows me if I am protecting my AWS assets with snapshots and the cost per month of the current snapshots in my account. The Footprint, Footprint History, and Footprint Creation dashboards allow me to drill even deeper into usable information. The Cost Comparison page shows you what it would cost to use Clumio's AirGap Protection service in comparison to building the same level of AirGap protection in your AWS account. Should you like the cost you see, and you will, you can select Protect with Clumio. Again, you will get a full listing of all your protected AWS accounts in one location. When I select an account, I get a protection overview of the account. If I filter for protected instances, you will see the tag keys and values protected by our gold policy. The gold policy is set to do a daily backup and retain them for 31 days, plus a monthly backup which is retained for one month. I'm backing up to the same region my assets reside in, but I can also select to send the backups out of region in case I want to recover from something catastrophic in another AWS region. Your backups at some point will be used to recover a file, directory, or complete instance. If I select one of the protected instances, a calendar view pop-up allows me to see the Clumio backups available for the instance. If I simply want to restore a file, I can use the global search for keyword search. I locate the file I want from what is available in the catalog. Then I select how I want file access to occur. If I select a full instance recovery in advanced mode, I can select the account to restore into, which can be in the same region or another. This is very useful if your production AWS accounts have been ransomed and you need to recover to a newly created account in a new region. For RDS, it is very similar to recover a full instance, but we also give you the option to recover specific records within your instances. If I select one of the granular record retrieval backups available in the instances calendar, I get a schema browser which lists all the DBs and tables available for restore. 
If I write a very simple select all query, I get a preview of the records prior to restoring them. Once protected to Clumio, you can restore at the file, directory, record, or full instance granularity. Plus, you can recover to any account or any region you require. In the event of something catastrophic like a service outage in a region or a ransomware attack, Clumio becomes the fastest recover option in your toolbox. I also want to give you a sneak peek of our S3 Protect service. This is the industry's first S3 protection platform. When I'm looking through the inventory of one of my AWS accounts, I'm now able to select S3 Protect as a service. I have five different buckets that are part of this account. One of the many innovations we have created is the ability for customers to create protection groups. A protection group allows you to specify what objects you want protected and from what buckets the objects are coming from. When I select protection groups, I have a single protection group named media. When I click on the edit button, I can walk through the options set for this protection group. It is named media. I have one of the five buckets selected to participate in this protection group. And within the bucket, I am able to define which specific object prefixes I will want to protect. It is not an all or nothing backup solution. You can be very granular in what objects you are protecting. I also get to select the storage class I want protected. I also get to select what versions of objects I want included, the latest version or all versions. On the next page, I select a previously created protection policy which backs up this protection group every day and retains it for one month. I'm also protecting this to Clumio's cold tier. We also offer an archive tier which is called Clumio Frozen. Now that the protection group is being backed up, let's take a look at the recovery process. When I click on the protection group, I get a nice calendar view which shows the dates I have backups for. When I select a date, I get an option to restore a single object or multiple prefixes slash buckets. If I select to restore prefixes slash objects, I get to select the specific buckets that I want to recover from. In this case, we only have one bucket that is part of the protection group. I get to preview the list of objects and their details that I'm about to restore. I now get to select if I want the latest version or all versions of those objects, what AWS account I want to restore to, the bucket that I want to restore to, do I want to create a prefix to restore into, and what storage class do I actually want to restore those objects to. That is it, a granular protection recovery strategy that allows you to be very specific about what objects are being protected and restored. If you want to see more, please feel free to register for our early access program on the Clumio homepage. Thank you for your time, and please feel free to reach out to me directly by emailing nick at clumio.com. All right, great presentation, really cool demo. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, we've got some questions for you coming in from the audience. If you have a question for Clumio, now's the time to get it in. Um, I want to point out, I've just brought up the first of two polls on the screen. We want to get your feedback on this. Uh, the first poll is, which clouds is your organization using? I select all that apply. So if you use it more than one cloud, you know, of course, select more than one. And uh, I'll share the results here of that in just a moment. All right. Uh, Nick, you ready for some Q&A? Yeah, great. Looking forward to it. Excellent. All right. Um, first question here that came in, they're asking, how, how is this air gapped if it's still connected? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So although you, you connect your account to Clumio, the way the service is broken down on our side is that it is SaaS. Uh, we're not spinning up any resources in any of your accounts to make this work. And then we have a separated uh, control plane is what we call it, and that's separated from a data plane. So any like backup configuration, any uh, request for backups, the dashboard where you log in and have authentication is all handled over a control plane. However, the backups actually uh, occur over a separate a data plane. When data transfers, it, it's encrypted. When it lands, it's an encrypted, immutable, append-only storage. Uh, so in, when it lands on our side, that's considered air gap because there's no connection between kind of like the control plane services uh, nor the uh, data plane, and, it, and all of this resides 100% outside of a customer's uh, AWS uh, cloud account. If a hacker ever got to one of our buckets by any chance where we're actually storing backups, they'd also, they wouldn't be able to make sense of what resides there because they'd also have to get through 
you know, 100 odd AWS services that we use to, to build the platform to make anything, any meaningful use out of the, the data that we are storing in a backup format. Excellent, excellent. All right, uh, next question here. Uh, there's a couple of them around, actually related to the, the poll question that's on the screen, uh, just in terms of cloud support. So uh, I'll share the results here of this. It's a pretty close tie, actually, between AWS and Azure uh, in the 30% for each. Uh, GCP, 10%, other clouds, 10%. So thank you to everyone who responded to that. And I'll just bring up a second poll now, and that is what additional information would you like about Plumio? And uh, Derek from the audience said that uh, your presentation and demo was great. You made it seem very easy. He'll be in touch. So I'm, I'm sure there's a number of other folks out there who want to uh, get a personal demo of this as well or would like to try it for themselves. Um, so back to the question about clouds. Mm -hmm. uh, Eugene is asking, uh, does Clumio work with Microsoft Azure? Yeah, so today we support AWS. Uh, we are embarking and building out our Azure service now. So there, like I mentioned earlier with the control plane and data plane and the platform build on the back end. So that's underway. Um, we will start re releasing uh, data source protection within Azure within the first half of 2022. Um, we're still organizing and kind of prioritizing what comes first, but it, it, it seems like the main requests have been around Azure VM, Azure Managed Disk, Azure Blob, uh, various forms of deploying SQL in Azure, um, as well as Azure uh, AD. So I would expect all of those to start being released um, in the earlier months of 2022 throughout the remainder of 2022. We'll start to, we'll have that full breadth of services also available up in, a, in Azure. Excellent, yeah, that's exciting. And I know you all recently released support for uh, protection of AWS RDS, is that right? Um, yeah, we have RDS. We also have, um, we're just in early access uh, for our S3, which is pretty awesome. I had a, a sneak preview demo uh, in, the, in the recorded session there. Uh, that's going really great. We have a bunch of customers already testing um, that as well. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of continued innovation um, over the remainder of this year with an AWS and then next year uh, a focus on to, uh, to Azure. Awesome. Awesome. And then here's another question. You might have heard this before. They're asking, um, I've coded up some backup scripts to handle, you know, protecting AWS already. If I've done this, why would I want to use Clumio? Yeah, we, we've, um, we've went over several customers that are, you know, that had a, a do-it-yourself approach. Uh, because, you know, early on with an AWS, uh, snapshots were like the only protection strategy, but building – something that's even close to like a secure air gap solution where, you know, the snapshots don't just reside within the account where the production services reside um, was a challenge. So, you know, scripts with, you know, copying things to additional accounts, uh, maybe in another region, uh, securing those accounts. You know, we have customers that were uh, replicating snapshots from multiple accounts to like a bunker AWS account and then securing that the best they, they could. Um, there's a substantial amount of cost because you're, you know, you're duplicating the snapshots that you need in both locations now um, so that you have a secure copy away from production. And then uh, customers are racking up some pretty substantial uh, data transfer costs uh, between their different accounts and different regions to create that type of solution. On top of that, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day operational basis, there was no, you know, not many customers got into building UIs that had like calendar views for restores, tracking where snapshots were in what regions. Um, you know, it was very, very complicated for them to actually, you know, build out that type of uh, ease of use. Uh, and then on top of that is making sure they were in compliance with like third parties like HIPAA and High Trust and PCI and SOC was a was a nightmare for them. So this is, you know, looking at Clumio, this is all we do. So our we know we have all the certifications and compliance. We handle all the data transfer. We handle all the backups. You're always air gapping one time. So we're also doing things in a, in a much more secure and cost effective manner. And then we build in all the, you know, the, the backup and uh, restore workflows 
and we also support it. So we had we have a couple customers in like the thousands of account range where they were managing this themselves, and just having our team support the backup and restore process from our side, they freed up a whole bunch of time from having to manage their do-it-yourself builds. Um, so simplicity, cost is also great. So simplicity, cost, and then making sure that everything's secure and compliant are those are the three main reasons customers. Uh, started utilizing equipment, even if they had built their own type of, of system for backups. Absolutely. Yeah, I can see where this could help a lot of companies out there who are doing, you know, the AWS DIY approach. So really cool. Well, I know final question before uh, we're running out of time here in the live Q&A. If folks want to get started with Clumio, uh, you said, I, I believe it's really easy to try out. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, just go to the AWS Marketplace, do a search for Clumio, C-L-U-M-I-O. You'll see a, a listing there for both our free Discover Insights tool, so you can see how you're protecting your data today. Um, and if you'd like, uh, also select Protect, and then you can utilize all the services that I demoed for EC2, EBS, RDS, um, Dynamo, and then upcoming year shortly, we'll, we'll enable S3 for all customers. Uh, and then with the Protect, you get uh, 30 free days 30 days of free credits uh, to test out the service. And then, uh, you know, feel, always feel free to reach out to, uh, to us via our, our home uh, portal, our home uh, website, and we can uh, get you onboarded as well if you don't want to go through the marketplace. So, yeah, easy to do. Customers can onboard themselves to Marketplace. Excellent. All right. I like that. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have in our live Q&A. There's some more technical questions there for you in the queue, Nick. Great presentation and demo. Thank you so much for being on the Megacast. Thanks for having us. For more information, of course, check out Clumio in the AWS Marketplace. There's also a, a report there in your audience console in the Handouts tab for additional information. All right, I'll leave up the poll question while I announce our next prize winners. Uh, we've got an Amazon $500 gift card. This one going to Ann Robinson from Virginia. And our next grand prize for another Microsoft Surface Pro 8, this is going out to Joe Durting from California. Congratulations, Joe Durting from California and Ann Robinson from Virginia. And now it's time for our next presentation on today's Megacast. I'm excited to welcome back uh, one of our frequent presenters, a friend of Action Tech Media, Mr. Andrew Miller. Principal Systems Engineer at Pure Storage. Andrew, great to have you back on. Take it away. Just putting great events together. And uh, hey, I, I know I promised to pay you 50 bucks last time you did a kind intro. I'll make sure the check gets in the mail at some point. Let's dive in though. So as it says there, here we're, we're here today, and as you know from the event, Disaster Recovery, Business Continuity, DR as a Service. We're going to do this a little bit workshop style. What exactly does that mean, though? You're like, hmm. So what I realized as we dove into thinking about this topic is that we've actually got way more as pure than we can talk about than we could cram into 20 or 25 minutes. So I figured we're not even going to try just because there's, there's so much goodness to cover. We thought we'd go a different direction because otherwise you'd be like, ah, make it stop. There's so much you're trying to cram in here. So thought instead we'd start off with you know, about the first half here today, sharing data protection, DR architecture knowledge, and then move into how Pure can help in this space. Hopefully that sounds fair. We'll have a really small bonus item around ransomware. Now, if you're thinking like, who is this guy, Andrew Miller, and does he actually know anything about this topic? I figure if we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I should introduce myself. Andrew Miller, Principal Technology Strategist at Pure. Um, I actually have probably potentially most importantly for today started on the customer side for seven years, admin, to engineer to architect, might have had some disaster recovery plans in there that may or may not have gotten approved. I've learned more about financial justifications over the years. Uh, eight years as a partner, SE to manager to director, two years building out a tech marketing team actually for a data protection company, a startup. Uh, spent a, a week or two a month in Palo Alto. I wandered around the US and the globe a good bit. Um, and But then even in that time, it was in hyper growth mode. So just you learn a ton when the company is going from 200 to 1300 folks and you're hiring 12 people in two years. I've tried, tried not to lose my technical soul over the years. That's even uh, really appreciate the vExpert program from VMware, uh, Corey Romero, uh, of course, John, uh, John starting that way back in the day. 
Now, why do we care about this topic? Why do we have to sometimes dive into a little bit of this kind of front-end education or thought process? And this could even be called maybe answering the why, if you will. So let's think about this. If you go to your CIO, your CTO, you know, talk about disaster recovery, DR as a service, data protection, I won't keep saying those over and over again, but you ask what their expectations are. You know, say, how much data can you afford to lose? Or how long can you afford to be down? Now, the answer usually, kind of the knee-jerk response is, I can't lose any data and I can't afford to be down at all, of, of course, right? Then we think about what our capabilities are from an IT standpoint. We think about the technology involved, array-based replication, uh, site recovery manager, automation, business continuity, all this stuff that goes in. And we realize pretty quickly that it's almost like there's an elephant in the room, you know, because the expectations don't match up with the capabilities and, and, and by the way, this uh, the one cool thing about this transition is the elephant just keeps scrolling if I don't stop it, you know, and sometimes I'm tempted like, yeah, I'm just going to let it keep going. I'll, I'll stop it here. But the core is expectations and capabilities don't square up, right? This is just the classic business technology challenge. So we think about what are we protecting against? Okay, not just like straight, straight up technical terms, but at a business level, you know, protecting against loss of postponed, lost or postponed sales and income fines play in here, a delay of business plans, uh, contractual bonuses, not even maybe personal bonuses, but you know organizational bonuses with contracts. We can lose customers over this, or they may be much less happy with this kind of thing and more likely to leave in the future. Timing and length of disruption, there's costs around overtime, labor, and outsourcing, and even just the very, very human side, employee burnout. This is really stressful stuff in some ways to prepare for. Sometimes the DR testing can be stressful, but especially if it actually happens, right? We're, we're living with this. So what is a disaster? Hmm? You know, I've, I've got twin 11 year old boys at home. Uh, so, you know, in the past, they're a little bit beyond this stage, right? Kind of thing. But if I came home to this, while well, there's some very happy kids in that picture, I, 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 or my wife, I think we'd consider this a disaster, but, but if we make it a little bit more, you know, realistic, there is actually a definition thanks to the IT service management forum, an event that affects a service or system such as significant effort is required to restore the original performance level. Okay. Now that also then leads into another set of acronyms. This is acronym craziness today, right? We know this, this is what we do. You've probably heard business continuity or BC, and be for BCDR, maybe even OR. So like say, say what, what, what are these things? So business continuity is the idea that something goes wrong, majorly wrong. Everything actually still goes on as normal despite that. We might lose a site there's no business impact on business operations, the most complex and hardest to set up, active, active sites, right? But the things just keep running as we scramble under the covers. Disaster recovery, this goes to the idea <clears throat> that we're coping, recovering with from an IT crisis, and we've got to basically push the big red button. It's a non-routine thing. We really think about it before we push the button. Large in scope and impact, you know, commonly failure of a primary data center recovering to an alternate site. Operational recovery, this is more just general data center architecture, you know, not having not having any single points of failure, you know, spoffs, if you will. Um, you know, I've got multiple paths from an MPIO or storage fabric standpoint that at my networking level, I've got multiple power supplies in my switches and 802.3 AD and link aggregation, all that good stuff. Because this is just normal day-to-day -day things that can fail and it shouldn't frankly have an impact. The business expectations, though, very, very much and greatly shorter for operational recovery. Hey, you just should have baked this in when you buy the product. But at minimum, we should have clearly defined objectives for each and make sure that we know the difference and have communicated that difference. So what does this look like in your in our environment, in your environment, right? You know, think about some of the scenarios we put out. What scenarios should we be planning for? Maybe like, like you see there, maybe it is a hurricane, maybe otherwise hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. Where do we begin and, and how do we do it? Okay, so let's keep pulling this down as far as how we think about this. Hopefully you know these acronyms, right? Recovery point objective, recovery time objective. But sometimes when I'm talking about this, I, I like to frame it in the way that you just heard a little bit ago. Just get people thinking about it because recovery point objective is really from a point in time when they're disasters. Let's say the disaster is declared at 10 a.m. or the, you know, the point where we've lost stuff. Recovery point objective looks back in time. This is the question we were trying to get people to sit up and listen to you a little bit. It's like, how much data can you afford to lose? You know, in the event of a disaster or recovery, how far back in time are we going? Recovery time objective, I'm sorry. and actually, this is often determined by the replication technology, 
can be process and documentation, et cetera. RTO is looking forward from the point of time we declare the disaster, not what happens, but we declare it. How long does it take to come back up? This also often is affected by process, documentation, runbooks, automation. And RTO is even a little bit of an interesting definition because is it, you know, I'm back online at the storage layer because I'm on the storage team or at the VMware layer or the application layer, or the website layer that your CIO, he, all that he may care about is we're actually back online and taking orders. Well, that, what is that, how does that map to all the infrastructure pieces that are involved, right? Kind of thing. There's also the classic bell curve here. It's our friend from a comprehension standpoint, but it's also a challenge in that the closer that we get to zero real time, we know there's higher costs. Now, technology keeps shifting, there's competition, there's technology advances, but we know that the closer we get, and sometimes you know the stuff that you do in hours, to protect for hours, you may be able to do minutes or 30 minutes for free in that same technology set, so they blur together a little bit. So we're thinking about RPO and RTO. We go and ask people like, what do you need it to be? And it's like, well, oh, nothing, or I don't know. How do, we, how, do we, how do we take the next step there? This is where we get into the idea of business impact analysis, BIA, yet another good acronym. This can be something you do internally, a mindset or an approach. It can also be something that you'd actually go and do in, you know, science formal consulting engagements, five, six figure consulting engagements. Fundamentally, it's a process to understand the monetary impact of this disaster failure. What are the most time critical information critical processes and how much does the business really rely on that? What are the recovery capabilities and you know what were the constraints on those this should very much be composed of two things both a technical discovery data gathering as well as talking to people some things you can't quantify i remember one story there was a consultant that i worked with who actually he did this stuff he did these uh, consulting engagements where he talked with someone and they said oh this is a totally critical application can't be down at all Five minutes later, employee pokes his head in the door and says, hey, boss, you know, such and such is down. It's like, ah, eh, I'm, I'm in the middle of a meeting. Let me know if it's still down in 30 minutes when I'm done. And the consultant's like, wait a minute. You just said, well, eh. so teasing in the human element, not just technical discovery. The goal is to get out of this priority tiers of applications is, you know, putting together the RPO and the RTO. So we know the cost impact of the business of downtime. And then we can map the technologies and the cost and complexity of the technologies to them because cost when we were talking about it here, cost is not always just at a financial level. It can also be at an operational complexity level. I don't have time for extra projects because I did this. So we're trying to map this into tiers. This is a totally, you know, sample example, okay? We also have here the concept of risk over time, right? That every time that we do a test of this, then we know, you know, the risk actually, if the risk actually drops down dramatically, right, because we've done a successful test. And then we have this idea of a testing gap. There's changes in the environment, new applications. And we start to, you know, there's a loss of confidence here potentially, because of course there's been changes, so we can't be as sure that it'll work the next time. So frequency of testing comes in because of that lack of confidence and technologies that facilitate that testing. Of course, ransomware comes in here as a scenario, because now this is often with not just disasters, but human actors with malicious intent. And sometimes I'm a little snarky in saying it's a, it's a problem requiring unplanned restore of huge amounts of data from systems that weren't designed for it, right? Because the ransomware attackers we're seeing are often taking off the primary replication methods, often the DR type things. The last thought here is around high impact, low probability scenarios. You know, we think about disaster recovery data protection, DR as a service. This is in many ways our kind of our last line of defense, right? So when these, when we need to use this, it's very high impact, it's critical, but we're not using it on a day-to-day -day basis, hopefully, right? We've got all, either, we're handling things at an operational recovery level, some things with business continuity, but this isn't every single day we're pushing the button or doing major recoveries. In that case, high impact, low probability, complexity is the enemy. If the systems that are critical, but we don't use very often, require day-to-day -day care and feeding, they won't be there when we need them, right? This is where, for better or worse, we can be kind of in this scenario, you know, like we know there's problems and we got so much going on each day that as long as the fire is just keeping my coffee warm and it hasn't actually gotten to me yet, hey, hey, I'm, I'm all right, you know, I'm surviving. So what about pure? There is a lot here, so I want to give you a little bit of an overview and then we'll, 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 we'll dive in, we'll cherry pick a couple items and dive into them. Now, so what about Pure? When we look at this space, data protection recovery, there's six key trends that we think about, and you'll, you'll see them actually reflected through a lot of what we're doing. 
Restore time, RPO, and especially RTO is becoming dramatically shorter with dramatically higher amounts of data in play. Uh, ransomware is a big factor there, but not the only one. Data replication, data portability, higher volumes of data getting duplicated in different places and needing to have that ability to move data around more and more frequently and faster. Cloud being a target for disaster recovery. That's all a goal for a lot of organizations I talk to. The continuing of abstraction layers. Virtualization continues to mature and have continuing impact, but containerization especially is starting to transform. In some cases, it's layering on top. Sometimes it's alongside. But being able to think about these abstraction layers and how do we think about that, handle them for data protection. Given the increasing complexity of the data center, how we keep building higher and higher stacks, we have to make sure to simplify and automate or else the last line of defense won't be there when we need it. And data, it's not as cold anymore. If there's higher expectations around restore time, reuse of actually what would have been cold data. So I like to often think about this from kind of a, a continuum standpoint. So in you look at this, hopefully it's a little bit clear. You know, you see RPO here from a local standpoint. We're going to start out with a local data center. So, you know, RPO is kind of zero in here, right? And then RTO kind of goes up. So at a pure level, this is why when I started out at the beginning, it was like, there's more than we can cover. So I'm not going to try and cram everything in because there's stuff like, oh, went the wrong way. Stuff like active cluster. So this is pure, this is active cluster. This is synchronous replication, even potentially inside your own data center for really high availability. Do object versioning. Snapshots, clones, snapshots that are what they want to be when they grow up. They're pointer based. They don't take space when you create them. There's no performance impact. You can take thousands, even you know, potentially up to 100,000 of them, maybe more over time. Rapid restore, very fast restore. Of course, this is leveraging Flashblade, as you see kind of the little logo there. And even offloading of data via, you know, snap to NFS, offloading snapshots to object or to NFS inside the data center. Huge amount of work with backup software integration inside the data center. Many backup partners, Commvault, Veeam, Veritas, Cohesity, Rubrik. Like, I'm not trying to leave anybody out, right? There's a lot of them. But then even a very specific partnership with Cohesity on the Flash Recover powered by Cohesity product that actually takes the speed and throughput performance of Flashblade and marries it directly with the Cohesity software stack. We think about orchestration. There's a lot from a policy-driven nature. We're even pushing this even further, but that you saw with some of the recent announcement around Pure Fusion. Appli tier one application integration, SAP, Oracle, and SQL, pushing the awareness further up into the stack. Our integration with SQL Server Management Studio is a great example there. So many integrations with VMware, it's almost hard to count, so we only talked about vCenter and VRLI. It's like, you know, out the wazoo. Container pieces, we'll talk about that more later. We're going to give it its own slide. And... This is all from an array standpoint, while there are some separate pieces and products here, from an array perspective, all the array software is included as part of our evergreen approach. It's not just a maintenance contract, it's more than that. It's an evergreen subscription because for instance, you know, a couple years ago, customers, we hadn't actually released Active Cluster. People who maintain an evergreen subscription, maintenance but more, actually got that capability for free. That's pretty crazy. It's actually usually licensed and cost separately, much less the complexity. All of this wrapped by Pure One online software as a service management that actually every Pure customer has access to for monitoring and planning. Let's flip that around from a remote. Oh, and I almost forgot. We wrap ransomware specific protections around a good number of these thanks to core immutability of snapshots, as well as what we call safe mode, which goes to the scenarios of even if there's been admin credential compromise of your Pure systems, preventing the actual final deletion of data, even if someone put a key logger on a storage admins machine. That's a really hard scenario to protect against without huge amounts of extra complexity and, and crazy air gap approaches, etc. Next, what about thinking about it from a remote standpoint? So going outside the data center, active cluster, well, synchronous replication, that applies here too, because you know, this is usually within, say, 100 miles, give or take. But then also, we recently introduced active DR. This is RPO that's in the low seconds, really dictated by your network speed. You know, the IO comes in, and as soon as the IO comes in, it gets shoved across the link. Of course, there's asynchronous replication, snapshot replication, and file replication. Now, some of this is at a flash blade or flash array levels. The object replication, of course, on flash blade, because that's where we do cool object stuff. You can actually offload snapshots to the cloud thanks to portable snapshots. That's related to snap to NFS and snap to object. Similarly, from a backup software integration here, but you know, spread that across sites. 
And then, of course, you'll see the same things because it is the same. It applies to remote data center level around policies, application integration, pure one, things included. Let's take a couple areas here, though, and dive a little bit deeper, really kind of three of them, I think. The first would be around containers. So as you may know, uh, Pure acquired Portworks a, a little bit more than a year ago now. There's really kind of two key ways that I like to describe this, because as it says there, Portworks is a Kubernetes data services platform. Okay, so first you're like, mm, Kubernetes data services, so where would I use this center? And how could I use it? So where, well, that's kind of where there's this any message. You know, any application, you see a lot of different applications listed up there kind of thing, as well as just about any Kubernetes distribution. I want to say every single one, but, you know, ones that are, you know, full on Kubernetes distributions, in some cases hosted distributions, that's EKS or JKE with Amazon and Google Cloud, right, kind of thing. Multiple cloud support, Let's see AWS, Azure, Google here, supporting this because this is a... Um, Portworks is a software only layer. While we want Pure to be the best uh, best storage underneath Portworks, and actually the largest Portwork customer before the acquisition by Pure actually independently chose Pure because they wanted the software to be the storage to be invisible. We have and will continue to have support um, for other products. This is one of the few times you'll see these logos on a Pure slide. So, you know, I enjoy it for a second. Uh, sometimes we see a lot here where we, we partner and embrace and extend HCI capabilities, for instance. The other way to look at it is so you know what does it actually do what does data services platform mean? so this is about you know six different modules that you see shown here well from a store standpoint this is about provisioning storage having the same apis to provision kubernetes storage whether you're on-prem in the cloud in different clouds csi in play or not different things underneath the covers of the different application backup and dr well of course that's the topic that we're here for in a day but not just eh, backup, but actually backup that I can go up into a Kubernetes, into a container level for consistency. DR that actually has sync, asynchronous and synchronous capa uh, replication capabilities, again, at a Kubernetes layer that's super unique. Migration is about data portability between availability zones, maybe between on-prem and cloud or between different clouds. Security, of course, that matters. Encryption, uh, encryption pieces, access control and auditing. Autopilot helps with efficiency of provisioning and automated provisioning in public cloud scenarios. Uh, some cases that can actually save enough money to justify poor work by itself. So this is a whole platform. We'd love to talk more with you about it. Let's go a very different direction. Let's look at our core platform of FlashArray. This is where Pure got started, right? So what I love here is actually starting with, just like you saw, I'm not making it up. We start with what about RPO and what about RTO? And within the flash ray platform, you can have synchronous replication, near synchronous replication, active DR, asynchronous replication. You know, this is based on snapshots, snapshot portability and local snapshots. Now, the key here, a key here is to me, this is not just a, eh, we got a bunch of technologies and you see them kind of represented here with some of how I narrated it. But what you'll notice is not on this slide is anything about extra cost and licenses, about extra hardware about complexity you know it actually you know, it says built in right there for a reason so to me this is partly about an architectural flexibility thing we don't know i mean i i never knew i, I make my best guess at what rpo and rto were going to be but sometimes the customer coming to me with workloads didn't know much less they would change over time so there's this really cool concept of, me of kind of architectural flexibility Sling comes in it only needs to be replicated every hour but then it changes or the it goes down and the cio says that's actually really important now well, we can move it up to, we can do things with making it synchronous without a huge investment in extra hardware, licensing, crazy setup. And even as we go from sometimes, you know, longer RPOs to shorter RPOs, there's not this huge complexity tax where the day-to-day -day operational overhead almost precludes us from using the extra capabilities that we want to. There's, this, there's a simplicity baked out through all of these, not just from a setup and a licensing and cost standpoint, but the day-to-day -day operations. I haven't tried not to lose my IT operational soul. Last but not least, of course, I don't think we're allowed to talk about data protection or DR without saying ransomware in there somewhere. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Pure has what I like to call a trifecta of capabilities or before the attack. You know, it's very simple to implement and operate during the, and this is actually policy driven stuff where once it's set up, it just runs. And this can be for your primary data. It can be for your backup data. It can be for your logging data. Protecting logs is critical during the attack. Pure snapshots have been immutable since day one, and we've got an, an extra layer of protection against the final deletion of data on pure arrays. There are snapshots or volumes. We call that safe mode. 
and they'll charge for it. It's included back to that evergreen theme as well as after the attack whether it is amazing throughput from a backup standpoint or that snapshots, hey, you can copy from a previous snapshot before the time of encryption you know, to a new volume instantly. And if you have to have multiple restore iterations, that cycle, that restore iteration cycle can be dramatically faster. Now, we are putting our money where our mouth is here. I actually see there's a ransomware recovery bundle. Uh, this can actually apply in some cases to data protection with safe mode in play as well. Uh, of course, there's some fine print, but as it says, you know, there's there's some decent savings potential. And while this is a limited time thing, it is available. I think I'm blocking that it says until January 31st, 2022. With that, I think I'm going to go to a few questions. I really appreciate the time as always. Uh, a couple that I want to cover here. Uh, three, I think, if we can squeeze them in. First, uh, does Pure charge for the various replication features on Flash Array or Flash Blade? Uh, so the answer there is we were referring to this a little bit, right? So everything from a Flash Array replication standpoint, we'll go to this one, for instance, it's built in. The replication software and capabilities are built in. Uh, there is just to be very upfront, there's a little bit of an asterisk there in our current partnership with the Comprise around some replication capabilities. We don't actually charge for the software, we charge for the support given the structure of it, but overall, when you look across the pure portfolio, we do not charge extra or have extra hardware needed for the replication capabilities. Second, why did Pure acquire Portworks? So <laughs> this actually goes to, as Pure, we wanted to accelerate in this Kubernetes level, Kubernetes data services platform. We'd already been doing a good bit here, Pure Service Orchestrator. We were seeing that this is where the world is going. Any given customer, different paces, right? But this is very much where the world is going. You want it to be about data, and not just about storage. Finally, did I hear correctly that FlashBlade can enable greater than a petabyte of data restored per day? You did. You did. So actually, some of the hero numbers there, around 270 terabytes per hour, uh, we mapped out in a lab over a petabyte per day. Uh, that was actually bottlenecked by the front-end flash array systems, not by the FlashBlade. Just, we only threw seven of them in that lab scenario. So yes, there's amazing throughput numbers here from a flash blade standpoint. With that in closing, planning and architecture is critical. That's why we wanted to dedicate some time to that at the beginning. But simplicity and flexibility, that's also critical, right? You gotta have it. And we believe that this is enabled by Pure's comprehensive, all included, simplified, differentiated data protection capabilities. Thanks so much, Actual Tech David, for having me today. Thank you all so much for listening. If you have questions about this, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. We would love to talk to you more about anything I covered or even some pieces that I didn't. Thanks. Have a good day. All right. Awesome presentation. Always great to have you on, Andrew. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I know the audience did as well. There's a lot of great questions coming in. Andrew is responding to those as quickly as he can uh, electronically here now that we wrapped up the live Q&A. Um, so keep those questions coming for Andrew. If, uh, if you have questions still, of course, don't forget about our best question prize. Lots of good questions coming in. I've just brought up the poll question for everyone out there. We appreciate your feedback on this. What additional information would you like about the pure storage solution? And I'll leave that up for everyone to reply to while I announce our next prize winner. We have an Amazon $500 gift card. This is going out to Todd Key from Ohio. Congratulations, Todd Key from Ohio. All right, thank you to everyone there who responded to the poll. We do appreciate your feedback on that. And now I'm excited to introduce you to Mr. W. Curtis Preston, Chief Technical Evangelist at Druva. Hey, Curtis, it's great to have you back on. Good morning. Glad to be here. All right, so I'll just jump right on in here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And in fact, uh, definitely a, a good evening to my friends in India who are celebrating uh, Diwali. I understand there are uh, is a ridiculous number of fireworks going off right now. So <laughs> I hope you can hear the presentation. Um, we're going to talk about this concept of backup and DR in a single service. I, I, for those of you unfamiliar with my work, I've been in backup and DR and archive and all of these related topics for just shy of 30 years. And one of the challenges that we've always had 
is that there, there were DR sort of fell into two camps. There were those who just basically thought of DR as a box of tapes, which it, <laughs> it never really was, right? Doing disaster recovery with a box of tapes was always a horrible idea. I, I did many a, a DR test. I, I've never actually done a disaster recovery, you know, I don't know if you guys know the phrase fired in anger, right? I never actually did it like for real, but I did a lot of DR tests with boxes of tapes and it's just a horrible way to go. But the, um, the, that was one group. And then there was the other group that said, there is no way that a backup system in any way in the best possible world could possibly fulfill the requirements of a of, of an actual disaster and so we're absolutely not even going to consider using the backup system for the purposes of dr and so we're going to do the replication for anything that quote matters right and so that gave birth to a lot of you know a lot of products right i, I did a lot of work with um Back in the day, for those of you that remember, you know, EMC's SRDF, right? That was that was a real big DR tool, and there were a lot of replication tools. The biggest problem that I always had with that, you know, I wasn't, you know, as a person who was with the backup system, it wasn't that I was, like, insulted that the people weren't going to use the backups. I, I knew the facts. I knew what the typical RTO, recovery time, well, recovery time reality, or RTR, was of a typical backup system. So I knew that it couldn't meet what they wanted. What killed me was this concept that we were paying for two completely separate systems to do essentially the same thing, right? Let's take a copy of the data and, and move it to another place. And, uh, you know, and, and then, uh, and then use it to, to, to restore things, right? Just, just restore it for different reasons. And here's this world that I grew up in, right? I, you know, I, I cut my teeth back in, uh, 1993, back at uh, what at that time was the second largest credit card company. And I was the backup guy, right? And I saw a, a backup system go from basically a server with an included tape drive to this monstrosity that you see before you. It It is, you know, over the many years, we, as technology evolved, as things got better in some areas, worse in some areas, tape got better, it got more reliable, but it also got too fast for the job, right? So it became a fundamental mismatch of technology where you had uh, tapes that actually, you know, uh, modern tape drives go close to a gigabyte a second. And meanwhile, you have this incremental backup plugging along in a, at a few megabytes a second. It's a fundamental mismatch of technology. And as a result, the tapes got unreliable. Then we, we started using disk caching. Then we started using dedupe disk targets. But, but they were also too expensive to have, you know, multiple of them. So, so a lot of people use dedupe. We, we use some dedupe and then we use some tape. We use tape for offsite and DR. And uh, we'll use dedupe for on-prem, you know, day-to-day -day operational recoveries. But then also we're going to do replication. To you know, to a replicated disk array for the for, again for the stuff that matters, we have to manage the a backup vendor. We have to manage a, a, a server vendor. We have to manage an operating system vendor. We have to manage a tape vendor. We have to manage a tape vaulting vendor, a dedupe target vendor. It, it just it became much much more complex than it ever was when I joined the industry. Um, you know, I, like I said, clo close to 30 years ago. And it just cost more and more. It was unpredictable. And, and yes, you, you, were, you were never compliant or it was just really difficult to, to be compliant, right? Um, so basically what, what we'd like to propose is something a little bit different. We'd like to protect the data uh, because one of the things that I forget to mention <clears throat> on the, um, the previous slide is that one of the problems is that all of the backup systems up to now have been data center centric backup systems, right? You have this thing or this array of things in the data center that is responsible for backing up the data. And that made a perfect sense when 
the data center was, you know, the center of data. It no longer is. Data is now all over the place, right? So we think that we should protect the data wherever it lives, right? So hybrid workloads, those that are, you know, in the data center and also in the cloud, uh, cloud workloads that are that are native to the cloud, and then also endpoints. A lot of people and a lot of backup systems tend to forget endpoints because, frankly, protecting them is quite problematic with traditional systems. What I, I think you, you would want is a system that can scale on demand, right, without managing uh, all this infrastructure that you tend to have to manage with a traditional backup system, and that can grow up and, just as importantly, grow down with a predictable uh, consumption model, meaning that you pay for it as you use it. You, you, you pay more when you use more, you pay less when you use less. And also, we shouldn't have to have multiple backup products. The, 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 it is very common, uh, I forget, it's been a while since I've looked at the stat, but it is very common for companies to have at least two and sometimes three backup products. We'll, we'll pick one backup product to, to back up cloud. We'll pick another backup product to back up our virtualization stuff and another backup product to back up our endpoints or our physical servers. And that, that, that's just a mess, right? So what if we had a unified experience, right? And supporting all of those in a way that both meets compliance as well as security standards, right? The other thing is this thing has got to be secure. The, the, the world that we now live in where we have ransomware, I'm going to say vendors, because that, that's what many of them are, ransomware vendors, not only targeting your data, but even specifically targeting backups, right? We've got to protect these backups. They've got to be stored in a way that ransomware attackers can't get to them. They also have to be encrypted, both in transit as well as uh, uh, you know, when at rest. So that if they do get stolen, uh, they, you know, they, they, there's nothing that can be done with them, right? They also need to be isolated from the things that can, you know, the, the backups should never be stored next to the thing that they're backing up. And, and, and that's true both in a data center as well as a, a, a cloud world, right? We, we can think about what happened with uh, just Google OVH fire if you, if you weren't aware of this fire that happened in what was the or still is the largest cloud provider headquartered in france and it they lost one entire data center and then most of the data center that was right next to it and even people that paid for you know it appears that people that paid for the backup service that OVH provided even lost data because the data was stored. It said it was physically isolated, but it turned out that physically isolated, it looks like that meant that it was stored in a, in a server over in the corner. That, you know, the cloud isn't magic, people. The cloud is the wonderful thing and <laughs> brings a lot of things to a lot of people, but it's not magic. It doesn't change the laws of physics and the laws of fire. And um, so it's got to be physically isolated no matter where your data is, your data, <clears throat> your backups of that data need to be stored in a different place. Um, there's a lot of positive business outcomes that can come as part of this, right? Better business con continuity, being able to just <clears throat> roll on uh, if something happens, uh, reducing TCO, uh, improving the, the flexibility here. This is a big OPEX versus a CAPEX play, right? Typical backup systems are purchased in large capital purchases every three to five years and you have to guess to get them right and you know you you never do right you either guess high or you guess low and if you guess high you wasted a ton of money actually even if you guess perfectly you wasted a ton of money because you have to buy three years worth of stuff today um and most of that even if you guess correctly goes unused for most of that time uh the other thing is to be able to to improve and, and get better uh slas uh, and to and to mitigate risk against theft and, and other things, right? So this is the <clears throat> this is the Druva Cloud platform. So it is a single service. It runs in. It's powered by AWS. And in order to use the service, you do not need any infrastructure on prem. 
you you need to connect us to the things that we need to talk to vmware hyper v uh, 365 your laptops whatever it is you you put the appropriate agent or in the case of vmware like it's an ova that, that plugs into your vmware environment and that 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 gives us authentication into that world and then we perform uh, block level source side deduplication globally across your entire environment, saving both bandwidth and uh, cost savings on the back end. Every, everything starts with cloud backup, right? So everything is backed up from your environment to the cloud. And the, uh, everything is encrypted before it's sent and it's stored in uh, encrypted chunks of data in S3. And uh, that, that your capacity grows as you need it and shrinks as you don't need it. We also provide DR on top of that. We provide a number of other services like e-discovery, compliance. <clears throat> we have a whole separate uh, system specifically designed for recovering from ransomware. We also have an automatic tiering system to move older backups out to l lower cost storage. We also have a, a specific service for those that want to back up large NAS systems where you already have, let's say you like, uh, you know, you, you like a NetApp, for example, and you, you like the NetApp story where you have an on-prem and an off-prem, maybe a replicated copy of your backups. And so that's your primary recovery mechanism. We give you a lower cost area to send a copy of that data just in case, and also for long-term retention. Um, uh, that, that's lower than the, the cost of the rest of the product. And everything is uh, charged um, for uh, on either a per gigabyte or per user basis, depending on if we're talking about uh, cloud and hybrid workloads or things like laptops and uh, 365. <clears throat> so the um, you get role-based centralized management from a modern console and you get a lot of insights and things, uh, you know, just one off the top of my head, you get this insight of um, understanding what types of files are being backed up and we can notice trends and, and spots Say, hey, uh, you're backing up a lot more files of this type than you ever were before. Uh, and, you know, perhaps you might want to look at it and you find out that one part of your organization, for example, has been doing media uh, production that you didn't know. And, and while it's, it's interesting stuff, it's not something you necessarily want to have in your backup. And then you push a button and then we automatically exclude that data from backups and we can delete it from existing backups. By the way, that, that one little feature and, and it plays out into a lot. It's because we don't store backups in big blobs the way most backup products do. Every backup is stored. Like every thing we back up is chopped up in little tiny pieces and each little tiny piece becomes an object in S3. And so if we need to surgically remove some files from backups, we can just remove the objects that um, cr create those files. Uh, super, to get, super easy to get started. You just, um, you know, like I said, put the right agent in the right place and then do your first backup to the cloud. We do have, for those with larger environments, we do have uh, an automated system for doing that first large backup, often referred to as the seed. It's offered at no cost, no or no extra cost. And um, Amazon sends you, uh, you know, a uh, Snowball Edge. You plug it in, you back up to that, you send it to AWS, and you know, uh, they upload it to your account. Another really interesting thing with being a SaaS service is really important to understand that this is a SaaS service, unlike almost every other product out there, which is based on software that you install and manage. Um, this is a SaaS service like 365 or Salesforce. You automatically get all of the most recent updates and everything. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we have automated ransomware recovery. We have a number of compliance uh, tools that automatically make sure that you're complying with various regulations. Uh, the storage insights was the thing that I just mentioned where we can notice things automatically. We use machine learning to to recognize patterns and to recognize that patterns have changed, right? And then let me just talk about this DR piece here for a bit. So because we are storing uh, data in the cloud, um, actually, I'm going to get back to that because I have a later slide on that. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to that here. It's a summary version is one click DR. So this is, um, uh, you know, just some nice numbers for you, you know, 
we have over 50 Fortune 500 companies. I actually think that number's increased since the last time I created this slide. Uh, over 2 billion backups a year and uh, certified MPS, uh, again, has also increased to 89 from the last time I created this slide and over 200 petabytes of data under management. <clears throat> Customers also love us. The industry loves us. We were recognized as a leader in the most recent Gardner Magic Quadrant for uh, the enterprise backup and recovery solutions. And we're the only all SaaS vendor represented in that MQ. Um, that's a, you know, a look at that. They really like this, this pay as you go model. They liked it backup restore and DR all in one piece. And um, that it supported, a, a, you know, as I mentioned, a, a broad range of functionality. So here's what I, I just wanted to mention that <clears throat> because we have your data, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my voice this morning. Because we have your data already in the cloud, we are able to create another copy of that data in the cloud in a virtual private cloud that you own. <clears throat> and then we can do disaster recovery against that image, right? So basically you do a one-time configuration up front in terms of specifying what you want in terms of RTO and RPO. And then once you've created that, um, uh, once you've created that configuration, when it's time to either test or create a disaster recovery, you can do it literally in one click, right? We, we, you create the runbook that you want. We automate that, uh, that failover. We also do uh, one click fail, fail back. There's unlimited amount of testing. The only cost that you incur is that you do have this VPC that you're testing in. There is a bill from Amazon for that VPC for the VMs and storage and whatnot that you're using for the VPC. But there is no cost from us uh, for as many tests as you would like. Uh, just a you know one um, the, you know this is a, a company that's been in the news quite a bit lately with uh, you know fighting against the coronavirus. They had had uh, quite a bit of growth and hundreds of terabytes of data and uh, a lot of tools and difficult processes. What we were able to do is help them improve business continuity, save money, consolidate all of their tools to one platform, just like I talked about, and then also having um, both consolidated backup and DR in one tool. And, uh, it, you know, according to them, we saved them 70% of the amount of data that they were spending on their um, backup and DR environment. So we do have a free trial that's available for you and also a TCO calculator. It's easy to get in touch with us at Druva.com. And um, also, if, you know, um, yeah, and I'll, <laughs> I'll turn things back over uh, for a Q&A. Always a great presentation. Thank you so much, Curtis. We do have some questions for you. Um, I'll just bring up this poll for everyone out there that says what additional information <clears throat> would you like about Druva? And we appreciate your feedback on that. Um, let's see, a lot of good questions coming in for you, Curtis. Uh, first one I see, I'll start with this one from Carrie, who's asking about uh, compliance. Hey, how does that work with compliance? Uh, they're talking about you know, NIST, HIPAA, SOC, things like that. So that's a lot of a uh, lot of compliance uh, acronyms all at once, but <laughs> so you know it, it it all depends on what you're trying to comply with, right? So uh, one of the there there are common things to a lot of the compliance regulations that data has to be securely stored and um, you know not not accessible to the wrong people, right? So the concept of least privilege is part of our tool so that uh, we have role-based administration so that different parts of, that each person who's administering Druva is only given the, uh, the, the level of uh, power that they need, right? And you, just, you, know, you as the customer decide <clears throat> the functionality that each person is allowed to do. And that's one that that's a really important, this concept of least privilege, a lot of backup procs, it, it's, it's just, you know, the person who runs the backup is, is essentially, you know, they, they're given God level access within backups. They can create backups, run backups, restore backups, delete backups. They have all that. We, 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 you know, separate that out uh, and you're able to, to do that. And that's one way that you can 
ensure that data is both uh, stored securely and also not accessed. An another thing is about um, the way we can prove immutability, right? To, to prove that because of, because of the fact that we store data in S3 and because every piece of our every piece of your data that's stored in S3 has a fingerprint, you can very easily demonstrate that whatever you're restoring is what was originally backed up, right? Also, because it's stored in S3 and behind many, many layers of security and firewall, which I don't have time to go into, you can, you can show that it's not able to be attacked by ransomware or by a black hat, right? <clears throat> We've also been adding some additional levels of security to essentially protect you from yourself is one way that I would put it. One of the challenges in backup environments, as I mentioned, is often that the backup person has a little bit too much power. And so we're adding more and more features in order to essentially protect from either accidental deletion. We already have a feature, for example, um, to protect of uh, if you d delete a bunch of backups, we have the, essentially a recycle bin for backups so that you're able to come back and say, hey, we had this rogue administrator that a few days ago deleted a whole bunch of backups. We need to put them all back. So we have uh, features like that. Uh, there, there are also features, and I'll real quick talk about the, these ideas of uh, things like uh, right to access or right to be forgotten. We have features that are built around that for GDPR and CCPA. Um, like I said, way too many. It, I'd have to drill down specifically on a particular uh, regulation to answer more. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good, good information there. Um, uh, another question, and I think you, you talked about this, um, is um, there's a couple of them here actually around you know, protecting the data that's, that's backed up from ransomware. So what does Druva do around that? So um, the first thing, and I think this is really important, is that <laughs> we don't store it on-prem. There are a lot of really good backup solutions out there that still store the data on-prem. And many of them advertise immutability features built into their platform. And I, I don't want to, um, you know, attack any one vendor, but the, the, just the concept of, of on-premises immutability is one that I, I just, you know, as a former on-prem system administrator, I, I know if I have access to you, if I have physical access to your system, immutability is doesn't really mean anything. Um, so one of the thing is that we don't store the data on-prem. Everything is stored in the cloud. And it's also, there's a number of transformational things that happen from A to B so that th just the way that ransomware works, it, 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 it's, it starts in one system and it spreads to another system the kind of systems that, you know, that there is no system in the cloud for it to spread to. Your data is stored in S3 um, behind multiple levels of protection. For example, the only thing that can read or write from our S3 objects are our processes that are, that are only running when backups or restores are running. Um, there is no way for the data to get from A to B. Also, just the fact that it's in object storage versus file storage, um, you know, at least in this point, beside the many, many levels of security and protection, just the fact that it's, ob even if it was object storage on-prem, um, you know, that would be better than file storage on-prem, which is what most of the backup vendors use. Um, and then there are, there are all these protections that we have. We actually notice unusual uh, data access, either uh, a lot of, uh, you know, file deletions or a lot of suddenly a bunch of files that are being backed up that weren't being backed up before, right? So um, we can notify you. It appears that Curtis's laptop, you know, has been attacked by ransomware because suddenly a whole bunch more files are being backed up. And then we have these tools. Again, I don't really have time to go into it, but we have a unique ability to do a restore over time. So people back up file, you know, you get infected on day one. You don't know you have ransomware until day 15 or 20. We can actually restore all of the unencrypted and unattacked data throughout that entire time frame, the latest version of each of those files, um, which is a, a unique ability that only Druva has. 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, I know we're running out of time here in our live Q&A, but if folks want to get started with, with Druva, you said it's super easy to do. Can you, can you tell us uh, what the steps would be? Yeah, so the, there is that, that URL. The, I believe it was druva.com sl slash free dash trial, I believe it is the URL. Uh, yeah, there, my memory, my memory serves well. And uh, that is uh, really simple uh, to do that and to, to try out because, again, unlike a lot of competitive products, you don't need, you know, there is no, there's no supply chain issues, right? <laughs> you, just, you just download something, install something, and then start backing up to us. It's super, super simple. Awesome. I like it. Yeah, it sounds super easy to do. Uh, the free trial, there's the TCO calculator there on the screen, or just get in touch uh, over at druva.com. Uh, Curtis, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. Anytime. Also, don't forget about the Handouts tab that's there in your audience console as well, the 10 Principles of a Cloud Backup Service by Druva. All right. I will now announce the winner, actually winners, uh, of our next prizes here on the Megacast. We have an Amazon $500 gift card. This one's going out to Alex Mednick from California. Congratulations. And our next grand prize for another Microsoft Surface Pro 8. This is going out to Dave Carr from Pennsylvania. Congratulations to all the prize winners. And with that, it's time to move on now to our next presentation on the Megacast. I'm excited to bring in Mr. Adam Berg. Solutions Architect for Cloud Native Technical Partnerships at Kasten by Veeam. Adam, take it away. And welcome to this webinar. My name is Adam Berg, and I'm with Kasten by Veeam. Today's webinar is called Enhancing Kubernetes Data Protection and Disaster Recovery. This is a really, really exciting space, this Kubernetes and Cloud Native ecosystem. And in this presentation, we're going to be sort of getting into the rise of Kubernetes and cloud native and take a little history lesson on where we came from and, and where we're going and what's really driving the acceleration of this really exciting space. We'll talk about Kasten and where we fit in and what makes us the market leading and number one data protection disaster recovery tool in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And then we'll get into a demo. So let's get right to it. Let's start off with talking about industry trends and the rise of Kubernetes, because I think this is really, really interesting to understand where we came from and where we're going as an industry. You know, if you recall, you know, back in the early pre-2000s, you know, the 1990s, you know, was really the advent of these extremely powerful servers in the data centers. You know, they became so powerful that, you know, you know we developed this technology, you know, really driven by uh, uh, VMware, where now we could run multiple operating systems on top of the same physical infrastructure. And that was really a game changer for network consolidation, server consolidation, down into running you know, dozens or even hundreds of individual server-based operating systems on top of uh, you know, condensed hardware. And that was really a, a game changer for the industry, and it very much still is, right? It really is the backbone of, uh, of, of the modern cloud, this idea of server virtualization and allows us to you know, drive all new application types and application deployment models. You know, but you know, as we you know, went along, you know, this, as this idea emerged that you know, we really don't need to be running all of these different operating systems, right? Um, each with their own sort of patching mechanisms and security vulnerabilities, you know, especially when you're trying to, to scale out and make these on-demand scalable workloads, this idea of containerization really started to spring up around, you know, the mid, uh, mid, mid 2000, mid 20, you know, 14, 2013s is, you know, really driven by the advent and, uh, you know, of this idea that, con you know, we, sh we should containerize the application. We should remove the application, separate the application from the underlying operating system. And that makes the applications much lighter weight. Uh, it makes the applications uh, independent of the host operating system. And now I can distribute these applications and scale the applications independently of the operating system, right? The, 
Uh, it's really driving a new way to develop applications and scale applications. Uh, this company called Docker really sort of popularized containers in, uh, in, in a mass way um, where you know, it was now available and, uh, to larger audiences. And as containers became more popular and uh, 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 the new way to sort of deploy applications, we needed a way to orchestrate these applications. The same way that VMware brought things like vCenter to the forefront, Kubernetes now has become the default tool for containerized orchestration. It really is an orchestration tool. It, it helps you to... Uh, manage the on-demand scalability aspect. It manages the uh, networking and security separation of, of different applications in, in pods, as we call them, in, in the Kubernetes space. And um, Kubernetes really is helping to accelerate the continued growth of this, uh, the space that we call Kubernetes and the space that we call containers. It's really, really exciting. So it's, what's really driving the maturation of this space? Because it's really changed a lot over the last couple of years, really. Um, you know, and it's really all about this idea of, of what we're calling infrastructure transformation. Um, changing what the underlying infrastructure looks like for the applications that uh, serve and deploy data to uh, the consumers of that data. Um, Kubernetes really makes applications available uh, everywhere and increasing the production usage of those containers. Uh, the rise of hybrid clouds, right? The ability to you know, deploy applications in a multitude of different public clouds, whether that's AWS, uh, Azure, Google, or your own private cloud on-premises. Uh, Kubernetes really makes applications now seamless across multiple clouds and, uh, and allows this, the data to really uh, become closer to the end user. And what's really driving the maturation really uh, in Kubernetes is, is, is this concept of stateful applications. You know, initially, I think people thought Kubernetes was the place for what we called stateless applications, applications that didn't really have any permanent data to be saved or you know, these, these containers could be destroyed and created on demand. We didn't really need to worry about data protection. We're now seeing a lot more stateful applications like databases uh, being deployed inside of Kubernetes. You know, some of the most popular databases are things like MongoDB, uh, Cassandra, or uh, MySQL, or MariaDB. Uh, we're seeing these applications being deployed inside of Kubernetes more frequently, and that be because they're stateful-based applications, that means we need to protect them like traditional uh, data protection uh, that we would see in on-premises applications or legacy-type applications. So what are uh, what are key asks from customers when they start thinking about how do I protect my stateful applications as they're deployed within uh, my Kubernetes ecosystems? Uh, number one, they're looking for a Kubernetes native uh, applications, right? They're not looking for a bolt-on data protection from a legacy a data protection solution that was designed to protect physical infrastructure, designed to protect virtualized infrastructure, traditional virtualized infrastructure. They're looking for something that's uh, born in, in Kubernetes, born in that cloud, and lives with inside that Kubernetes cluster. They're looking for multi-layered consistency. That means consistent data and application resource capture, whether that's uh, cluster-wide resource capture, uh, application-wide. Uh, there's a lot more to uh, a Kubernetes-based application than just that stateful data. So they're looking for that multi-layered consistency. Uh, they're looking for freedom of choice, of course, right? There are, uh, if you know anything about the Kubernetes ecosystem, there are a lot of different Kubernetes distributions. You can run Kubernetes uh, on just about any type of hardware with any type of underlying infrastructure. Uh, there needs to be complete ubiquitous support across uh, Kubernetes distributions, uh, underlying storage infrastructure, underlying networking infrastructure. Uh, you, you don't want to be locked into a certain cloud provider or a certain, or a certain Kubernetes distribution. So they're looking for freedom of choice there. And they're looking for DevOps speed and scale. Uh, this environment and this ecosystem is changing rapidly. Uh, there's new releases all the time, new capabilities all the time, and you need to stay on top of that. This, is, this isn't uh, a monolithic type of you know, new releases every six months uh, or every year uh, deployment model. We, we got new uh, applications being deployed, new versions being deployed every week, every day in some cases. So you need an application that can keep up 
uh, with that DevOps speed and scale. They call that shifting left, right? Moving things quicker to that development cycle, quicker to that release cycle, and they're looking for applications that uh, understand that speed and scale. And that's really where you know, Kasten K10 is leading uh, this marketplace. So who, who is Kasten? Uh, what is our mission? So Kasten's mission really is to tackle what we call day two data management challenges and helping enterprises confidently run applications in Kubernetes, move those traditional applications into Kubernetes and, and know that they have a partner that's going to uh, solve all of their day two data management challenges. So what, what does Kasten do? So three core things. Uh, number one, backup and recovery. Right, we're going to protect the entire application, uh, whether that's uh, uh, staple-based applications or traditional-based applications. It's completely protected uh, by Cast and K10. We do what's called application mobility. Remember, we talked about uh, the rise of hybrid clouds, being able to deploy Kubernetes uh, clusters in different public clouds, uh, on-premises, being able to take applications that were developed on-prem and seamlessly move them up into the public cloud for production use cases or scalability use cases. Application mobility is actually something that's quite tricky in, in Kubernetes when you start talking about different underlying infrastructures, different Kubernetes distributions. Cast and K10 makes that available to you. And of course, disaster recovery. Uh, something you still need to think about uh, in Kubernetes. This doesn't change from traditional infrastructure. You want to be able to recover an entire cluster should you have an entire outage of a particular data center or maybe a, you have a regional outage in a public cloud, you need to be able to fail over and recover an entire cluster uh, during a disaster recovery event. So these are the four, three main capabilities of Kasten uh, K10 by Veeam. Uh, again, just to recap, we're purpose-built for Kubernetes, right? We are uh, designed and built specifically and, and natively uh, as a Kubernetes-based application, uh, extremely easy to use, uh, scalable, and secure for backup uh, and recovery, disaster recovery, and application mobility in Kubernetes. We are the industry's number one Kubernetes backup platform. Um, you know, not only are we built for Kubernetes, uh, purpose-built for Kubernetes, we're, of course, we've got complete built-in end-to-end security, uh, not only uh, network-based security and data at rest uh, security encryption, but we're also the industry's first ransomware data protection Kubernetes uh, product uh, in the market where we take advantage of what we call object lock capability on our S3 object lock storage to guarantee the immutability of data, guarantee that you have unchangeable, unmodifiable, unmodifiable copies of your data to recover in the event of a ransomware attack. Well, we've got the richest ecosystem uh, and alliance partner support in the industry, uh, extensive support across the stack, meaning ex most extensive uh, support not only at the Kubernetes distribution layer, and at the hardware underlying storage ecosystem, but also at the application layer as well. We've got specific integration for the most popular stateful applications being run on top of Kubernetes today as well. And we make this all extremely easy to use, right? State-of-the-art state of the art UI, uh, multi-cluster capability, manage all of your Kubernetes cluster from the same uh, dashboard, making global data protection policies, being able to seamlessly migrate applications between different Kubernetes clusters right from within the same UI. We're easy to install and extremely extensible as well. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into these use cases, kind of give you a, a, a full understanding of how we work uh, under the covers and what are those capabilities are, right? Um, of course, uh, we'll start out with backup and recovery. Uh, we'll talk, uh, dive deeper into disaster recovery and, and application mobility. So hopefully I don't need to explain too much around the need uh, for backup and recovery. All right, there's data within inside uh, your Kubernetes uh, clusters. There are applications that you want to protect. Um, you need to have a, a, a critical and reliable data protection uh, tool within your Kubernetes. Right? It needs to support multi-tenancy. It needs to support role-based access control. Uh, it needs to support polyglot, uh, polyglot persistence, which really just means we are able to protect data uh, in a multitude of formats, in a multitude of locations, right? Whether, uh, whether it's underlying storage or different uh, uh, data protection tiers of storage fully supported with CAS and K10. And it needs to scale and perform, right? And some of your Kubernetes clusters may be small today, but as they grow and as they scale, CAS and K10 grows and scales with your organization as well and provides all of that performance.
right? So some of the key capabilities here, of course, protecting that persistent data uh, within uh, Kubernetes applications, uh, restoring the known good states of applications, restoring individual components of an application, like maybe the secrets of an application, uh, or the networking configuration of an application can be re uh, recovered. Um, you could repair applications, right? If someone makes a misconfiguration, and uh, protecting any applications or uh, that don't have any internal uh, replication or, or DR functionality built into those, Cast and K10 provides that as well. And of course, we can provide audit-based compliance uh, within your Kubernetes clusters as well. Disaster recovery. This is critical, right? Um, you need to be thinking about DR in the same way that you think about uh, backup and recovery as essential capability within your Kubernetes cluster. You want to be able to protect those uh, cluster-wide resources, right? Being able to bring back all of the cluster-based capabilities that are live outside the application within the cluster, um, as well as all the applications as well. So Casting K10 uh, fully makes the ability to re return a state of an entire cluster back to the way it was during a, a DR event. Uh, complete use of policy-based automation to manage how those, uh, uh, how that data is moved off-site. And we can provide uh, things like cross-region um, uh, and availability zone uh, disaster recovery, uh, disaster recovery between on-premises and public cloud, right? Leverage the public cloud as your DR site or leverage your on-premises infrastructure as your DR site. And we do all of that by making what's called application transforms or storage-based transformation possible so we can actually take that Kubernetes cluster landed on a different Kubernetes distribution, landed under different in, uh, underlying infrastructure, and make that all seamless for you as well. And that really underpins this, this concept of, of application mobility, right? Being able to take an application, uh, move it from one location, one Kubernetes cluster that might be on completely different infrastructure, and move that over to uh, a public cloud-based uh, Kubernetes distribution like AWS uh, uh, EKS or uh, or Azure AKS or GKE on Google Cloud. Being able to move those applications between different Kubernetes infrastructures that have uh, greatly different underlying infrastructure and making that as seamless and easy as possible is one of the critical use cases here, right? Um, that cross-cloud mobility, uh, keeping those, um, uh, some of those applications on-prem, moving them into the cloud. Um, this, is a, this is a critical capability for most people running Kubernetes today. They're not just running one uh, uh, cluster, they're running multiple clusters, they're running a different infrastructure. Uh, you want to be able to migrate uh, those uh, applications. Uh, one of the other things that we enable here is things like cluster upgrades, right? If you need to move those applications off to a temporary cluster, upgrade that cluster, bring those applications back. Right, having uh, dev and test clusters within your environment, and being able to move applications out of dev test into production. Now I want to uh, jump into a demo. I know you've been waiting patiently, so I thank you. Uh, we're going to jump right into this demo. Um, we're going to show you application data centric approach to uh, to protecting a Kubernetes based application. We'll show you how to actually install Cast in K10, and we'll uh, uh, back up and recover an application. So. Let's jump right into that demo. And here we are in my lab. It's just three simple commands to get Kasten's K10 installed here. Add the Helm repo. And then we create a namespace for Kasten with a simple kube control command. And then we use a Helm install command to install Kasten K10. And in just a few minutes, our install will be complete. And we use a kube control command to see if all of our pods are now up and running. And they are. Let's get our service endpoint so we know how to access Kasten's web interface. Now let's jump over to the web interface. This is the interface for Kasten K10. Very modern HTML5 interface, as you can see, K10 automatically discovers all the installed applications automatically. Let's go ahead and install a WordPress application. This is nice because it's a multi-tier application with a database backend with persistent volume to, to contain the persistent, persistent data. As you can see, WordPress is automatically discovered by K10, and you can see the two persistent volume claims.
The first thing that we want to do in K10 is add a location profile. This will be the destination for our backup data. I'm going to add a generic S3 storage as our backup target. Once that's created, we're going to create a backup policy for our WordPress application. And this is where we set the frequency of our backup. I'm going to set this to hourly and make sure that we enable backups to our S3 target. We have the option to export all the data or only references. And this is where we select the applications. Cast in K10 allows you to add multiple applications per policy if you so choose. Once that policy is created, let's click Run Once to run this policy now. Now our policy is running. Let's go back to the dashboard to check the progress of our backup. In our activity bar, we can see that our backup is now running. Let's drill into the action and we can see the progress of our backup. Our backup is now complete. Our application is protected. You can see in Cast and K10 interface how much data we have, we've protected. And you can see that our WordPress application is compliant with our policy. Let's delete our WordPress application so we can test our restore functionality. We'll use a Helm command to uninstall the application completely. You can see that our pods are now terminating. And the application now is gone from our cast and dashboard. However, to, to recover this data, we can go to our removed applications and choose restore. Choose the restore point and click restore. K10 is now recovering the application from our S3 target. Interactivity bar, we can see that the process is running. We can click that to drill into the, the action. And our application restore is complete. You can see that WordPress is now back as a application and is still compliant with our policy. Let's use a kubectl command to validate that the namespace is, has been recovered and that the pods are now running in our WordPress namespace. And they're running. That's it for our short demo. As you can see, it couldn't be easier to do a backup and restore with Cast in K10 by Veeam. Thank you so much. I know your time is precious. I want to leave you with this. Cast in K10 is completely free to install and try on your own. So please, I encourage you, jump over to the casting.io slash try dash cast and dash K10 today. You can get K10 up in your lab. We're completely free for 10 nodes and less in your environment. You can install Kubernetes data protection completely free with Casting today. And uh, we encourage you to try it out. We actually have online labs as well. So you can actually try Kasten right in your browser. Um, go ahead and, and uh, visit Kasten.io for that free online training and free online uh, Kasten K10 demos. And with that, we'll jump right into a Q&A. Thank you very much. And my name is Adam Berg with Kasten by Veeam. Awesome presentation, Adam. I really appreciate that. Uh, for everyone out there, I just brought up the poll question that says, what additional information would you like about the Kasten solution? And we'll leave this up while we take your questions. Uh, Adam, I, I know that you and the Kasten team have been uh, responding to questions already a little bit there in the, the questions area. Uh, you ready for some Q&A? Yeah, you, you bet. Let's do it. 
Awesome. All right. First question I see here, uh, they're asking, what type of Kubernetes data does CAST and K10 protect exactly? So in addition to protecting everything inside the individual namespaces, so that's uh, think of like a namespace as an entire application set, uh, we also protect what we call cluster-wide resources as well. So in effect, we're protecting, we can protect everything inside of a Kubernetes uh, cluster itself because we can perform full disaster recovery on an entire cluster. So we can bring back an entire cluster as it was when, uh, you, know, when you well, want to recover in a DR event. So we protect everything inside the, everything inside the cluster. Awesome. Awesome. That's, that's good to know. Um, another question, um, I'm sure you get this sometimes, is about the licensing. How, how does the licensing model work with this? Yeah, pretty simple. So today we're licensed by node in your cluster, right? So that's it, right? You, you've got 20 nodes, you buy 20, uh, 20 licenses of, of K10, um, and it's you know, all you can eat. We don't charge by uh, the amount of data, uh, we, don't, we don't track the amount of data you're protecting or anything like that, just by the number of nodes in your cluster. And again, if you're 10 nodes and less, completely free. You don't even have to call us. You don't have to put your credit card number in or anything. You just uh, download and install Kasten and you can have uh, data protection for 10 nodes and less completely free today. Uh, so it's really easy. That's awesome. I mean, you, you can't beat that. If you have uh, 10 nodes or less out there completely free. Um, another question that came in here, they're asking about when it comes to running databases in, in the Kubernetes cluster, does this mm -hmm. back up the database? How does that work? Yeah, yeah, and I saw that I saw that come in. So I, I think they um, I think the question was around Kasten itself. So yes, Kasten does protect itself, right? Because um, in a uh, in a DR event, uh, you obviously need to bring Kasten back because Kasten runs as uh, an application inside your cluster. We actually run in uh, inside the Kubernetes cluster itself. So. Uh, because we're part of the Kubernetes cluster, we do protect ourselves, uh, and it is part of the disaster recovery to bring Kasten uh, back into your cluster uh, and then uh, and then recover all your applications after that. So it is, uh, it, you know, that's part of uh, part of what we do is protect ourselves and all of our configuration data uh, as well. Um, and one thing I don't know if I mentioned it during the presentation is, you know, I didn't uh, briefly touched on it is that we are uh, we were the first ransomware protected. Uh, Kubernetes data, uh, data data protection application in the industry, meaning that um, when we protect data to object lock enabled S3 buckets, that data is completely immutable, unmodifiable, undeletable um, for uh, 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 you know against uh, uh, ransomware attackers or against maybe uh, insider threats or even accidental deletion. We can guarantee that your data is available. So we can completely protect your data and guarantee that it's it is recoverable um, and unmodifiable for uh, for those data loss events. Awesome, and I like this comment here from James. He said he tried out Cast and K10, had a lot of fun setting it up, and the user interface was was really nice. Uh, that's great to see. Um, so if folks do want to get started with Cast, and I know you all have uh, the free uh, edition for up to ten nodes. Um, and a great way to learn about it and see it, I know, is the Kasten Labs, something that I'm going to try out for myself. Do you want to talk a little bit about the labs? Yeah, yeah. And this is something that's, um, uh, that we actually just launched to make it even easier. We, watched, we launched a brand new URL at the, uh, at the KubeCon event uh, that was just last month. And we launched a free Kubernetes training site called learning.kasten.io. So we encourage everyone to check out learning.cast.io for um, Kubernetes training in general, right? Where this is something that we're giving back to the community um, and just trying to educate everybody, um, you know, about our love for um, for this uh, for this community and this ecosystem. Um, we we give away uh, free certifications at learning.cast.io. We teach you um, not just about casting, but uh, and data protection, but about Kubernetes in general, how to create applications, how to get applications going inside a Kubernetes environment. It's all right in your browser, and it's with real Kubernetes infrastructure. This is not like uh, watching videos. This is actually interactive live Kubernetes clusters that you can use uh, right on that learning.casting.io website. Yeah, I love that. It's it's not just videos. It's not just you know a, a PDF uh, ebook or something like that. These are real. Uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters that folks can access and learn how to protect them, right. uh, and it's all completely free. So I think it's a great opportunity out there, uh, learning.casten.io. Um, 
Io. Is that right? Correct. That's right. Excellent. Yeah, free free Kubernetes training for everyone out there. You can't beat free Kubernetes training and free Kubernetes uh, backup uh, data protection right. as well. So um, I think that's a great place for us to wrap up here. Uh, Adam, it's been great having you on. I really love the demo as well. We got a lot of good feedback on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us. And for more information on Kasten, of course, there in your handouts tab, uh, there's a link to Kasten.io. Uh, you can also go to learning.kasten.io as well and try out the labs for yourself. And with that, it's now time for our next Amazon $500 gift card giveaway on the Megacast today. This one is going to John Lignowski from Michigan. Congratulations, John Lignowski from Michigan. And now I'm excited to introduce you to our next presenter on the Megacast. Welcome, Helen Patton, Advisory CISO at Duo. Helen, it's great to have you on. Take it away. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. Today, I want to talk about securing trust and really what the role of security is in an organization and for an organization. So I'm going to jump straight in. We're going to be talking about what trust is. We're going to talk about the elements that make a company trustworthy, how a security team within an organization can be perceived as trustworthy and also generate trust culturally within the organization. And then we're going to try and put that all together. So sort of the, if you're in the security realm, how, how do you, what things do you need to do to help you be a trustworthy leader? So we're going to jump right in. Why am I talking about this topic at all? I think sometimes as security people, we forget that the end goal of doing security isn't security. The end goal of doing security is making sure that our organizations are trustworthy and are perceived in the marketplace by our customers and our partners as being trustworthy. So when I think about the evolution of the security team and where security leadership might be headed, we're already starting to see a number of security people whose title isn't security, it's now chief trust officer, or it's something like security and trust. And so over time, I think you'll continue to see the security function incorporate elements of trust like privacy, like data governance, uh, like ethics perhaps, and all of those will get bundled together into one big trust role. That's my prediction. Uh, come and find me in five or 10 years and tell me how close I was to getting that right. But this is where I think we need to be pursuing security right now. A lot of people who don't understand what security people do wonder uh, why security even exists. And I think they can, they can relate to a concept of trustworthiness as being the purpose for security. So a few things about trust. Trust isn't on or off, it's not binary, and it's not permanent. So if we are gonna think about using security to build trust in an organization, we really need to be thinking of it as something that needs to be earned and something that needs to continue to be earned. And that's quite a big lift, it's hard to do. So what do I mean by trustworthy? Well, think about the people you know that you think are trustworthy. Um, that you, words like they're accountable, they're reliable and dependable. Um, I can trust that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. I trust that they're good at what they do, that they're competent. When we think about a person as being trustworthy, there are all these things and all these adjectives that you see here on the screen. Security folks, though, take a little bit of a different tack when we, they think about trustworthy. So first of all, all things being equal, we want to trust as little as possible. Whereas in, at an individual level, it's almost a flip. We, we want to trust as much as possible and then people lose trust over time, perhaps. That's a cynical way of looking at it, isn't it? But all things being equal, we trust as little as possible. And we use evidence 
and experience to know whether something's trustworthy or not. So again, we're on a personal level, I might be inclined to say, I'm gonna trust you, even though I've got no reason to trust you, I'm gonna presume that you're trustworthy, again, until you, you compromise that trust. But security people go the other way around. You have to prove that you are trustworthy, not as a person necessarily, but certainly within the context of technology and architecture and information. And then security people also have a tendency to think about trust in proportion to the risk that's involved with trust. But I think this is true for all of us. You know, we when you get in a car, you might put on a seatbelt, but you're not necessarily going to put on a helmet and leathers. Whereas if you're riding a motorbike, maybe you're going to put on helmet and leathers because the personal risk to your personal body is so much higher when it comes to riding a motorbike versus being in a car with four doors and a roof. Similar sorts of things in the IT space. We as security people may be very willing to trust if the system is not very important or the information is very public because we can afford for there to be lapses in trust in that environment. But when the environment is very critical to a business or the information housed within a system is very confidential, we don't have very high levels of trust. So we require a lot in order for trust to be given. And that usually translates into lots of access requirements and configuration requirements and all of those kinds of things. So security people, tend to um, take, the, take the approach, we don't trust until you prove that you're trustworthy, which is a little bit different perhaps than other people. So how do we think about a company being worthy of trust? There are four things, four, four, four things that go along with that. Responsible data use, securing the data, breaking down barriers that stop people, people from being trustworthy and managing the ecosystem. So let's talk about those things. When we as, as consumers interface with a, with a company, we want to make sure that the information they collect about us or know about us is managed very well. So this means the company needs to have good data governance. It needs to have a strong compliance ethic in terms of privacy compliance. And it needs to be thinking about the tenets of privacy, things like only collecting the data that is needed to satisfy the business objective, things like the right to be forgotten, things like um, the ability to choose and control where my data is used and where it is not used as much as possible. So responsible data use is one of the bedrock areas for companies to be perceived by their partners and their customers as trustworthy. So once you have the data, then you need to be able to secure it. And from a company perspective, it doesn't matter even how big the company is, but the company needs to have a plan for what security means and, and how they're going to handle it. Now, for some companies that are very small, maybe they're startups, maybe they're not handling a lot of really critical information, they might have a very simple security plan. These days, I wouldn't even say that that's completely appropriate either, given the amount of ransomware and other things that are out there. But it could be reasonable to say, look, if you're just starting out, you probably don't have a whole bunch. But as you grow and as your company matures, you're going to want to make sure that you continue to invest in security and have a plan for it. And that means things like having processes where you've taken security and privacy into account right from the beginning. So secure from the start processes. Things like testing your code or making sure that change management processes are in place or making sure that you're baking in resiliency into your technology and into your business processes. And certainly it means making sure that you've got internal and external communications plans. So you can talk to your staff, you can talk to your internal stakeholders and your external partners and stakeholders about what you're doing and how you're doing it related to security and privacy. Securing the data goes a long way to improving trustworthiness in a company. Now within the company and even within the ecosystem of the company, working with partners and, and vendors and so forth, you need to make sure that, you, that being secure and being private is as simple as possible. So you've got to break down the barriers that stop simplicity from happening. That means making sure that you're talking a common language, using frameworks can help with that simplifying not only the security elements, but generally just technology and business processes 
across the board. So as simple as things can be, the more secure they tend to be and the more efficient they tend to be. So that also will help with trustworthiness if, if your processes, your technologies and the way you handle information is simplified and efficient. And then lastly, you've got to think about managing the ecosystem. This means partners and third parties. It means potentially different handoffs between different parts internally within your own company, from HR to operations, to finance, to legal and so forth. It means making sure that from a resiliency and disaster recovery perspective, end to end, you're managing to make sure that things can be recovered and as resilient as they need to be and that you've got incident response processes happening all the way across that. So the, all of these four things go into making a company trustworthy. So then the question is, what's the role of a security team? And I would argue that a security team needs to be trustworthy because if a security team is not, then it doesn't matter what they do, it's going to be hard to do and people aren't going to believe the outcome of the work they do anyway. So four things going into making a team and particularly a security team trustworthy, partnership, stakeholder education, competency and enabling the business. So what do I mean by those things? There's been a tendency historically in security to think that the people we work with, the partners that we have, are actively working against us as security people, that we're actively seeking not to be secure. And in some cases, perhaps that's true. But we have to be able to approach our partnerships assuming positive intent. And the positive intent may mean that their primary, our partner's primary goals is getting business done without regard to security, but that that is okay. The role then of the security team is to say to them, let me help you get your job done in as secure a way as possible, but not assume that they're actively opposed to the security agenda. So assuming positive intent goes a long way to smoothing the path so that communications can happen between partnership partners and be able to make sure that security is occurring. Once you have that open dialogue occurring, looking for opportunities where both sides win can be helpful in security. So things like improving the authentication paths that users take when they log into an application, improving that, streamlining that. So there's only one path to all company applications as opposed to multiple paths. First of all, something like that will improve the user experience, make it easier for them to do their job, which is a win for them, but it will also enable security controls along that authentication path, which is more efficient and more secure, and that's a win for the security team. So looking for those opportunities can be really useful in improving a partnership between a security team and other stakeholders, and it can make it then easy for people to work with the security team. So the security team, rather than being locked away and hidden behind closed doors, being open to engaging with stakeholders across a company to improve security processes, tools, will help the partnership. So partnership's a big one. Partners can only really partner together though if they're talking a common language. And you'll notice that this is true at the corporate level as well as at the security team level here. So again, using a common language is really important. The security team needs to invest time in helping their partners understand the risks and consequences of the, the technology and business decisions that they're making. This is really super important. It has to happen before a bad event occurs and that teaching piece has to be teaching and not lecturing. It has to be approached from the point of view of let me help you understand what you're doing, let me help you make a good decision, rather than let me tell you what you did wrong or let me tell you why my way is better. So this teaching of risks and consequences is really important to help educate stakeholders, but also build trust between the security team and the other people in the organization which means the security team, all the people in the security team, not just leadership, not just the training and awareness groups, but everyone needs to take on a mentoring role. Really super important to building trust. Of course, we're only trustworthy if people can depend on us to be competent. 
So when it comes to security, we need to be competent. We need to be drama free, which means our processes need to be as good as possible so that when incidents occur, we know what we're doing and we do it calmly and professionally. We need our responses to be super fast and we need those responses to be effective. So when thinking about your security strategy, if you look at things that the security teams are doing, particularly in incident response, but this is true in every part of security, look for ways to improve processes, make them predictable, make them well understood by stakeholders across the organisation. That will help demonstrate your competency because things will go wrong and they wanna know that you're a reliable partner when that happens. So demonstrating competency, really important here. And then lastly, from a security uh, trustworthiness perspective for a team, enabling the business, right? So again, security is not just for security's sake. Security is ultimately about delivering a trustworthy product, not a trustworthy security product, but a business pro product. So it's really important for security people to understand what the purpose of the business is and to be able to articulate why security helps the business along that journey. So thinking about for your organization, if you're in security, why do you do security for this organization and what business outcome does that support? And if you're in the business and not in the security team, think about why you would want security in your world and what you need out of your security partners in delivering your business goals. And if you feel that your security team don't understand that, that's an opportunity for you to partner with the security team to help them. The security team themselves needs to know this though. They need to be able to demonstrate that they understand the business objectives that are going on, not just the technology objectives. It's not just about being doing great FinTech or having really great manufacturing systems. Again, what's the business outcome that you're trying to support there? Profitability, probably, unless you're in a nonprofit, but even then there's going to be something even beyond that that you'll need to be able to articulate. And then thirdly, make sure that the security efforts that are underway are aligning to the areas of most importance to the business and particularly growth areas. So if there are major projects that are happening within the business, find a way to link security efforts to those efforts and it will demonstrate that you're understanding the importance of the business objectives and enabling the business along the way. Super important. All right, so we've talked about what makes a company trustworthy. We've talked about making the security team trustworthy, but how does it fit together? So in 2020, Cisco commissioned uh, an organization called Scientia Research to do a study, a double blind study where the participants didn't know who was asking the questions and Cisco didn't know who the participants were. And the purpose of the study was to look to see what kinds of security um, activities were out there that lent themselves to positive security program outcomes. And the result of that is a report, and you can see the link here, um, that talks about the security outcomes study that shows this um, ultimate report. There were three major outcomes that um, companies across the globe, there were about 1,200, I think, companies that were interviewed for this study, Three outcomes that were consistently rated as being the most important things, enabling the business, managing risk and operating efficiently. The thought was that if a security program did these three things, they were generally regarded as a good solid security program. And we all want a good solid security program. Now I know this chart is a little bit of a night chart, but you can download the report for free without having to register. So, um, I'll try and explain this. On the, on the vertical on the left-hand side are outcomes that align to those three primary outcomes of enabling the business managing risk and being efficient. So things like gaining executive competence is an outcome. Um, managing top risks is an outcome. Along the bottom are practices that support that. Things like proactive tech refresh, or role specific training or learning from prior incidents. The darker the square, the more positively an outcome uh, a practice was correlated to an outcome. So essentially, if you read from left to right along the bottom, 
those are the top five outcomes that most positively correlated to a good security program. So here's how the outcomes were grouped. So to think about enabling the business, it was things like keeping up with the business, gaining executive trust, obtaining peer buy-in and so forth. I won't read through all of these, but there were um, 11 outcomes grouped into these three major areas. I'm not gonna go into every tech security practice, but the top five were these five. Proactive tech refresh, which isn't owned by security necessarily, but making sure that the technology that's in use in a company is kept up to date was the most positively correlated outcome to a secure, good security program. Well integrated security technology. So making sure that the things that security uses to manage security is well integrated into that technology that is proactively refreshed, really important. Timely incident response, prompt disaster recovery and accurate threat detection. And you can imagine those three are all related to one another. You can see you use threat detection to have timely incident response and you have a good disaster recovery program that acts quickly, really important in having good security outcomes. We recognize now that it's not a matter of preventing security events, negative security events, so much as being able to mitigate them as much as possible with proactive tech refresh and good security tools, but then responding quickly when things do happen is essentially the story here. All right, what does this have to do with trust, you say? Well, from a team perspective, we talked about these four things, partnerships, competencies, stakeholders to the business. That leads to the company being trustworthy, having responsible data use, securing the data appropriately, breaking down barriers and managing the whole business ecosystem. So the team leads to the company outcomes. If we then look at the practices that lead to those outcomes, you will also notice that those outcomes align to those elements of trust. So aligning to the business, partnership, breaking down barriers, those things look like gaining executive trust, creating a security culture, keeping up with the business, managing the risks and so forth. So the practices and the outcomes lead you to trust. So what I'm hoping that you take away from today's session is that the purpose of security isn't security. The purpose of security is to help an organization develop trustworthy practices so that they can be seen as a trusted partner in the marketplace, a trusted employer, and a, and a, and a trusted leader, frankly. And that the security team has a role to play internally to assist the company to do that. But in doing so, if you do those things, you're also going to, in reverse, have a positive security outcome. So I hope you found this session helpful today. I hope you have something to take away from it. Go read that security outcome study and think about the things that you're doing to help your organization be secure and be trustworthy. And good luck. Great presentation, Helen. Thank you so much. Really wise advice. We appreciate that. Uh, I just brought up the poll question for everyone out there uh, about Duo. What additional information would you like about the Duo security solution? And I'll leave that up while I announce our next set of prize winners. I also want to remind everyone that we are uh, accepting questions, of course, about Duo security. We just ran out of time for our live Q&A session with such a great presentation here. And so keep your questions coming about uh, the Duo Security Solution. Don't forget about our best question prize as well. So the first Amazon $500 gift card winner that I want to announce is Aaron Guzik from Illinois. Congratulations. And then our next grand prize for another Microsoft Surface Pro 8. This is going out to Benjamin Young from Texas. All right, I'll give everyone a moment here to respond to the poll. If you haven't done so, now is the time to get your response in. We do value your feedback on what additional information you would like about Duo. 
it's now time for our next presentation on the Megacast. I'm excited now to bring in Mike Phelan, Senior Product Manager for Cyber Recovery at Faction. Mike, thanks for being on. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here today. I'm really excited about this. Well, we're excited to have you. Take it away. So I understand that I'm also the last uh, presentation of the day, so hopefully uh, I make it worth your while and we can cover some stuff that uh, hopefully makes a difference to everybody here on the, on the call. I know it's been a long day, um, but uh, Faction's got a little bit something different. So let me, uh, let me dive right into it and we can start talking about that. Um, so kind of already went through this. I want to hit on the data protection side and really want to focus on this multi-cloud um, world, which is where we live today. And we'll look at that in just a second here. Um, but first, before I, I do that, let's just jump in and talk a little bit about Faction, because I imagine most of you all haven't heard of us uh, too much yet. Um, anyways, we were founded back in 2006, uh, really with a legacy of hybrid and multi-cloud innovation. We've got multiple patents out there that talk about or, or are focused around how we connect to the hybrid, uh, the, the hyperscalers. Um, so really what we're doing, we, we are a, a cloud adjacent type of a, of a company, a solution. So we'll sit outside and next to your Amazon or your Azure type of uh, solutions and provide a storage solution. We also have the compute and the networking piece, but primarily think of it from a storage perspective. And we're able to, to put that, and then you can take that storage and put it wherever you want, as opposed to being locked in to any one um, provider. And we've got a lot of different locations. You'll see we've got uh, different uh, locations. These are the current ones. We have over, over 10 different um, spots around the, around the world, um, thousands of end, uh, uh, end, end user customers, and, and we have lots and lots of storage under uh, management. Um, and we do have some big partnerships. Uh, uh, Dell Technologies is a platinum partner of ours, and we are financially backed by Dell. And so a lot of our, our technology resides on that, and we've got a lot of different uh, unique solutions that we're going out to market with them around. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about where we are today. So most of us today are going to operate within some, uh, some sort of a multiple cloud environment or multi-cloud environment. Uh, if you look at some of the statistics and stuff like that, it's like 90% have uh, at least one cloud outside of maybe their primary data center. And there's like 60% uh, with that that have more than one cloud. So there is a lot of us that are operating maybe within a, a, an AWS environment and an Azure environment. And what we're doing when we do this is we're really creating these individual silos where we have things going on in AWS, we have things going on in Azure, maybe things going on in uh, Oracle Cloud, as long as our, as our own data centers. And this happens over time, right? A lot of times we will go out our um, our, 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 the, the people we work with, data scientists or, or engineering groups go out and, and, they, and they specifically go after or, or want to uh, create a presence on GCP, so the Google Cloud Platform. And they do that because of some special service or something that, that Google has that they want to take advantage of. But that's yet another spot then that we have got to manage as IT organizations. And, and really what this creates is that means that your data is only accessible to that, to that one cloud. So if I've gone out and created my cloud instance in Google, then all of my Google users and stuff like that can have access to it. But if for some reason I want to move that over to AWS, that takes quite a bit of effort. And that's not something that most of us are going to try to, to work through. Um, so that creates multiple IPs, we've got multiple volumes all over the place, which is going to increase our costs and potentially sync issues as we try to keep um, data similar you know, or synced up between these different environments. And then that will lead to higher network uh, charges because I get uh, egress fees. And overall, it really complicates uh, the management. And specifically for this summit, it really does affect your disaster recovery planning, my data protection planning. How do I, how do I manage that in this environment? Um, so really, you know, when I, when I look at this, I've got multiple different clouds that I'm, I'm operating in. I've got these clouds and really what happens then is, is we sort of create this dark cloud above them all because now I've, I've got all these problems and it really becomes a multiplying factor where I've got to now worry about compliance issues across these multiple clouds. And they're going to have different ways to solve it for each one of these. So you can kind of see how that is going to increase my 
uh, my management costs and, and just the, the, the thinking time to make sure that I am good across the compliance and security. Ransomware is another huge one. So think cybersecurity type of efforts. Uh, how do I manage this? And I've got, you know, I've got different sort of bad actors, but they're able to now start attacking me and my core business from multiple different locations. And all it takes is one entry point, and then they can get into my data center and start spreading and start doing the harm that they're looking to do. But they're able to do that because now I've spread myself out so thin that I can't possibly as an IT organization go through and start to protect myself. I've also got restore and backup issues that I've got to try to figure out and performance. Okay, am I getting the same level of performance across all these different clouds and stuff like that? So this is really where action comes into play. And what we can provide is a single cloud environment where I take all of those issues that we had and I bring them down together into one location. And I'm able to manage it from one spot. And so it really consolidates that, that data, it reduces that management overhead, and it really simplifies some of those planning processes that you have to go through. Uh, not to mention the, the governance and, and the costs and all those other uh, parts can, can also be greatly reduced over time as, as you're able to start taking advantage of this. Okay? So now, as I start looking at this, and I, okay, I've got, a, I've got a single copy of my data, so I get that centralized protection and centralized security. So if you look at the diagram first, you'll see that really I'm, what we're trying to show here is the fact that my data is going to live in the faction cloud. And this is where I can, I can do my, my data management, my data planning and everything else within that environment. And then from there I can push out or, or go and, and uh, grab the, the compute resources that I need. So I may have a volume that lives in the faction cloud. Remember I had mentioned this was an adjacent type of a cloud storage solution. So it literally lives adjacent to each one of these cloud environments. And then through our patented networking environment, stuff like that, we're able to quickly connect and provide whatever level of networking performance you need into any one of those clouds, into the, the Amazon, into the Azure, Google, uh, Oracle, there's other ones too. I mean, you've got IBM, you've got Alibaba and stuff like that that you could also connect to depending on, on you know, where you are geographically. But that really is where the compute happens. And that's typically why we get this sprawl is because we've got developers, we've got needs that we want to take advantage of some, something that, that one of those hyperscalers is providing. It's not typically a storage solution. It is really typically the compute side. Maybe it's additional GPU processing or some um, feature they have for analytics or artificial intelligence that, that we want to take advantage of. But the data piece would be great if it could go across multiple clouds. And that's really what Faction's providing here. So some of the primary use cases we have, and again, I'm kind of targeting it for this particular summit, but really, we're looking at this and being able to replicate to the cloud or from the cloud. I can, I can take data from the cloud and pull it into the, to the uh, faction uh, to be shared out against uh, multiple clouds. We've got disaster recovery to the cloud. I've got in-cloud protection, cyber recovery. I've got a whole other presentations and stuff like that around cyber recovery and ransomware recovery. Um, so if you're interested in those types of things, definitely hit up the website because there'll be a lot of information and detail there. But some of the benefits behind that as I start to consolidate this is a performance increase. Because now I get a consistent level of performance from my, from my storage environment that I'm able to really control and understand. I got the high speed, low latency networks into any of the clouds. And now it's just a matter of what sort of compute resource do I want to go to attach to. So it really gives me that uh, performance type and, uh, advantage. I get one global namespace. So as opposed to trying to manage multiple different namespaces as I go to these different clouds, I'm able to really create one and use it across multiple different um, environments. Obviously, I'm going to get some simplified management. I can capitalize on some different software expenses because now, again, I don't have to spread it across. I can do some consolidation of those environments. Um, the egress fees is another big significant um, uh, advantage. So if you're, if, if you're operating in something like a Amazon environment, uh, it's sort of like the Hotel California where you can check in, but to check out, it's going to cost you quite a bit of money. 
And so it's that data transfer and data movement piece that I'm sure um, everybody who's had that experience is, is you know, it's, it's not a pleasant one. It, it, it's usually a bill that's a shocker that says, wow, how much did it cost me to move this data? That's another big reason that, that uh, faction is, is really starting to take hold because that concept of being able to not have those egress fees is huge. So I'm not locked in. I'm able to take that data and do with it as my business dictates as it dictates so that I don't have to worry about that additional expense and I can put those funds towards, you know, more useful um, things. And then, of course, I, I also get to save when I compare against something like a, an AWS because now I can, they'll charge much more for their storage piece because they're trying to, you know, keep storage there and keep it active. And that's, that's a charge for that where, like on the Amazon side, you can shut down your compute. You can never shut down your storage uh, component or you'll lose it. You can delete it, but you have to rehydrate it if you were to do something like that. Of course, then there's a question of where did that data go. If it's living in faction, it can stay in faction. And then you can just use those compute resources as you need, bringing them up and shutting them down according to your, to, to your operational uh, desires. And now you're able to make all that happen uh, within, uh, within that environment. And then I've got the picture down there so you can kind of see where we are um, globally. So we've got multiple locations across uh, the United States. We've also got uh, London, Frankfurt, and Sydney. Um, We've got more on the roadmap that we're looking at standing up. It's sort of as, uh, as business dictates and see where we're going, but that's where we're at today. So it's, uh, it, it, it is uh, global and, and growing. Um, so I want to hit real quick. So we talked a little bit about that ability to, to connect to the different clouds. And I really wanted to show this, this screenshot because I think it really does um, highlight the ease of use and, uh, and how quickly I can stand up an environment. So I could take an, a, a system, a, a volume, put it in my faction cloud, and it, it stands up just like it would in an Azure or an AWS, you kind of go out and say, hey, I want uh, one terabyte or, or 100 terabytes worth of, of uh, capacity space at some performance level. I can get that within that environment. And then I go through a step that says, well, which cloud do I want to attach to? And in this diagram, you can see I, could, I was able to select a cloud in the, in the first step. In this case, I picked uh, uh, the Azure cloud. And then my next step is, well, what sort of um, performance do I need? And I can pick my level of performance that I want into that cloud. I can not only, I can do that, but I can also take, for example, if I had purchased a 10 gig pipe from uh, Faction, I can take that 10 gig pipe and I can spread it across to as many clouds as I want. So I may take five gig into Amazon and five gig into um, Azure as an example. And I can have that same volume attached to both clouds simultaneously if, if that's a business need that I have. Okay? Or I can um, switch between them. I can you know, increase one, decrease the other, those types of things. Any, anything I need to do within that environment. But this is that type of a easy, simplistic GUI interface that makes it happen. And we've got that infrastructure in place in the back end such that once you click this, it literally just happens um, within your environment in a matter of, of, of uh, seconds. So for a little bit more on the, the networking detail behind that, um, you can see here, and, and, I, and I like this because I, I think from this uh, group of people, you know, we tend to be a little bit more technical when we're, when we're on these mega casts because we're trying to really find that, that solution. You can see what I've, I've got my faction cloud here and we've got what we call the, the faction inter-network exchange. And I mentioned before we have multiple patent, patents and that's really where our patents live is, is in that uh, environment that we call the fix. And from that environment, we connect across to the multiple different cloud environments. So whether we're going through Google, uh, we can go through the express route into the Azure or over to the direct connect into the AWS. Those connections are pre-laid out. And then what we do is we purchase that and then parse it up amongst the, the clients and we will you know, add to that or subtract to that to each of those major cloud players depending on what we get from a, a, a client perspective. But then we hook everybody into the cloud. And that's really the magic that's happening here. So from a disaster recovery and a data protection perspective, this is the path that would be used to, to connect and replicate data across. 
so that we can protect it and I can bring it into the faction cloud and now my recovery um, options become quite extensive because now I'm able to protect it within the faction cloud. I can replicate it between faction clouds so I could replicate my data if that's what I wanted to do between my data center on the east coast and the west coast. So now I can, I've also got different recovery options if, if, if one side, uh, you know, if, if Amazon was to go down one side or another, I could quickly flip over and bring my, my entire uh, you know, operation back up in a different you know, Amazon environment um, within minutes. Um, so you, those, those are the types of things we can do quickly. Or if it wasn't Amazon, I wanted to bring it back up in, if I wanted to bring it up in a, in a Google environment or the, the GCP or Oracle, I could do the same thing. I could, I'm going to say I could take my environment, stand up in this, in this type of a cloud, um, and, and, and operate from there. Other reasons I may do that is there may be a cost advantage to, to um, um, moving it a, a, across these different environments. Um, now, from a data protection, really what this does is it pulls me out of being solely connected or solely um, tied to a single cloud provider. And it really pulls it together. So now when I go to look at my recovery options, I can recover to the cloud. And I can recover to any cloud. I can go back to my Amazon cloud if I, if I want to do that. I can go over to an on-premise environment or back to on-premise if that's where I had, was, was replicating from. Um, or I could even recover within the faction cloud. So I hadn't touched too much on that. But within the faction cloud, we also have the... Um, networking, um, obviously we have the network, but we also have a lot of compute resources similar to, to the Amazon cloud, not as extensive, um, but we have quite a bit of, of compute um, resource that, you know, we've got customers that have signed up that says, this is what I'm looking to do to be able to have, um, you know, recovery type options. It's not just recovery, a lot of people will run production there as well, but, uh, you know, given the fact that this is a, a disaster recovery megacast, that's what I'm, I'm focused on. So really, by pulling all this together, I'm going to be able to reduce my costs because I'm, I'm eliminating those, those um, resources that I need to manage my environment across multiple clouds and bring it into one environment. I can increase my performance because now I get that guaranteed level and known level of performance from my, my storage where I can, I can look at that and I can pick and choose the, uh, the appropriate compute environment, I can tighten my security because now I've got one spot that I can look and manage my, my HIPAA, my compliance regulations, and those types of things. One spot where I can make sure that everything's going to be met and we've got the appropriate certificates and stuff like that that shows how we're working and operating to make sure that those um, requirements are met. And I get simplified protection. Because now, as, as opposed to trying to learn and understand how I'm going to protect my environment across this multiple cloud, uh, you know, infrastructure that we're that we're operating in today, pulling it into one spot, now I can just simplify that protection, be it for disaster recovery, you know, some sort of data protection, or a cyber, you know, recovery event. These are the types of things that people are starting to look at to say, how do I simplify my environment and and, and get these spiraling costs. Know, under control. A few years ago, we were moving to the cloud to help um, alleviate some of those instances of that now we've got so many different cloud instances, it's really starting to come back around, but not back to on-prem, back to environments like what Faction has. This is we're going to be a cloud adjacent. We're going to help solve these issues, but still provide all the benefits that the cloud environment has in all those different compute resources that are um, available to us. Um, so hopefully that, you know, got us um, where we wanted to on the, on the presentation side. I'd love to know um, what your uh, the multi-cloud protection strategy is. Um, so we've got this poll question here. Um, so what I'm really looking to know is how, how you all are looking at these uh, in environments. And are we, are we really, is everybody protected? Do we have strategy for one cloud or all of our clouds? And where, where do we sit with those types of things? Because I, mean, I know my, where, where I, I think we are, but uh, these, these polls always, uh, always highlight different things than, than what I, I, where I think we're at. Absolutely, yeah. 
I want to call everyone's attention to, to the poll on the screen there uh, that says, what is your multi-cloud protection strategy? Maybe you only operate in one cloud, or maybe you have a, a different strategy for each cloud. Maybe not all are protected yet, or still kind of working on that. So we'll give everyone another moment here to respond. Yeah, I really appreciate it. We just ran a, uh, a, a survey uh, and uh, wasn't necessarily related to this disaster recovery piece, but it's always interesting to listen to and, and, and get back in touch with where, where we sit with um, IT environments today. I used to do a lot of uh, IT running uh, data centers, and uh, it's been a few years, but uh, it, it's amazing the amount of information that's got to be processed by uh, anyone who has has that type of a scope of a, of a job, it's uh, it, it 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 amazes me how much is is available today um, to to help us uh, or or confuse us as the case may be. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, it looks like uh, twenty twenty three percent roughly only have one cloud. Twenty seven percent have a different strategy for each one. Um, seven percent not all are protected yet, and and forty three percent still kind of working on their multi-cloud protection strategy. That's good. Yeah, so I, I, I hope that the, the presentations today helped you guys because uh, I'll tell you, I, wanna, I, I do want to you know, tell the guys that are running these, uh, the mega casts, they do a fantastic job of trying to pull together a lot of different um, vendors and, and get, get good information out. So I, I, I think these are typically a, a fantastic way that uh, IT professionals can get some, some uh, quick education. On, on the different uh, options available. We appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. Well, why yeah. don't we go ahead and yeah. move on now to another poll we've got uh, while we take some questions from the audience. Is that okay, Mike? Sure. All right. So another poll here is on the screen for everyone out there uh, that just says, what additional information would you like about Faction? And obviously, uh, there's a number of folks out there who are interested in learning more. We've got some great questions coming in. So um, I'll go ahead and just start with this one, Mike. Uh, Bradford is asking, uh, what type of workloads are best suited to faction? Um, you know, it, it, we don't have a specific workload. And the reason that is because from my perspective, I'm going to deliver um, a storage solution. Okay. So if you're looking at, at object storage, I can help you out. If you're looking at file, I can help you out. If you've got block, I can help you out. So we've got that. I've also got you know, high performance, lower performance type of stuff. It's really about that consolidating it, and then from your perspective to say, now, what, what sort of, of, of workload do I have? And, and being able to align that workload with where you want the, the, the workload to happen. So if you want it to happen on a, an Amazon type of environment, we can make that happen. We can help with those types of things. Um, if you're looking at Azure, I know Azure is doing a, a, a lot in their uh, uh, cloud. I'm absolutely amazed. I've been working with those guys uh, for the past several months, and I've been really impressed at the amount of um, just the amount of effort that they've been putting into the cloud, really to try to catch up with um, Amazon. But that's where I think it really is. It, it, it really boils down to um, what you're looking to do. So from a faction perspective, we're going to be able to match um, pretty much anything that you're looking for, and then we can help with that connection and that, st that standing up uh, in, in the, in your, in the uh, appropriate uh, hyperscale environment. I don't know if that answered it directly, but I'm not, I'm not trying to sell faction. I'm trying to help you guys understand that the, those are the different options that I see you've got out there. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, it doesn't sound like there's a specific use case um, or, or application, let's say, that is perfect uh, for faction, it sounds like it could help all sorts of applications out there and many different use cases, and and that's great. Yeah, um, on on the website we have a lot of the different ones that we've got um, like diagrams to help out with. So if you're looking at something like a Databricks, I've got some stuff out there on Databricks that would be more on the you know analytics side. But we also have a lot of information like on uh, cyber recovery, cyber security, disaster you know, protection as well. So it it, it kind of comes from both sides. Nice, nice. And then here's another question uh, they're asking. Oh, I lost it. Here it is. Um, so in the faction cloud, you know, you talk a lot about storage. 
does Faction also do compute and networking? We do, we do, and I and I, I mentioned that, but I, I glossed over it pretty quick. Um, yeah, so we we do have that compute and networking, um, and like I said before, our our compute options are not going to be as as extensive as something like an Amazon or or, or Azure, um, but we do have those options available. Um, uh, it's going to be very similar to, to the other ones and how they're they're set up and stuff like that, where you'd say, hey, I I, I need uh, some sort of a virtual uh, environment, uh, you'd have that delivered to you with the appropriate storage and um, the networking components. Uh, so yes, we, we do have all of that uh, available as well. Nice. Nice. And then another one here, they wanted to know, uh, you know, about ransomware protection. They, they say, you know, that's what is most critical to them. And Specifically, I noticed you had listed, but didn't have much detail on um, how does Faction help us to get more uh, or better protection from ransomware? Um, ransomware is a, is a huge hot topic. In fact, I did a, uh, a, a webinar last week, and it was focused on, on the, the ransomware cyber type um, protection. But uh, what we would provide is, as an example, it would be a cyber vault where if your data lived either like on an on-premise environment or like in an Azure environment, you could copy it into Faction and we would create a vault. And that vault then becomes um, something that would have you know, immutable copies so you couldn't change the data. And then from there, I mean, there, there's a process that it would go through. But in essence, it, it, you create those uh, the copies so it's locked down. There's an air gap type of environment so you can only get in really reducing any of the, the bad actors' ability to get in and affect the data. It's got the tool set to, to, to analyze the data, to understand you know, if there is a potential um, threat ongoing in your environment, because a lot of times these are, these are multiple weeks or months of operations that they're trying to get to, and that's where the, the analytics and the, the uh, machine learning intelligence happens. And then we've also got some recovery options, which aren't too dissimilar than what I was showing here today, where I can recover to different places but it's really that vaulting um, piece that's, that's really sets the, the faction part uh, or the faction offering apart because that's often a required uh, environment depending on, on what industry you're in. Got it. Got so, it. Okay. Yeah, but the, a lot yeah. of that's on the website. Okay, nice. And then uh, how does faction manage connections to all the different cloud hyperscalers that you talked about? Yeah, you know, like, like I hit on that in a little bit in the, in the, uh, the presentation, um, because we're adjacent, um, we're, we're literally uh, often in the same building, you know, in, in a separate cage, you know, if you will. Um, but we will work with those different vendors to, to get the pipes in place. So um, whatever sort of a, of a pipe we need, and those will increase over time as well, because, you know, as, as we get more and more um, customers in, in specific, you know, locations and stuff like that, we're growing those environments. But we'll have the pipes in place, and then I'd show that one screenshot that said, hey, I can, I can dial in how much performance I need. That's how easy it is. So the infrastructure will be there, and it's just a matter of how much the customer base in that particular site will consume and move around. So that, that will go out to the main um, you know, networking switches in that building and then off into the appropriate um, uh, hyperscaler. But uh, there's, like I said, I think we have a, we're up to nine different um, patents around how we manage that network and how we balance between the different hyperscalers. Excellent. Very cool. You guys are doing some really cool stuff there at Faction. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have in our live Q&A here, but there's some really good, maybe more technical questions available for you in the, the electronic Q mic. Uh, great okay. presentation. Thank you so much for being on the Megacast. Uh, my, my, my pleasure. And again, um, hats off to all the, the, the folks who stayed on and, and made it through to the end. Uh, I, I know these days can be long, but hopefully the information you got from all the different vendors, I hope you all got uh, some good stuff out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's our, always our goal here is to help uh, IT organizations solve their challenges, you know, specifically today around data protection and DR. So hopefully everyone got some, some great information here. And I want to remind everyone about the handouts tab as well. Uh, there is a link there to 
Mike's full presentation. You can download it in PDF. So thank you to Mike for making that available. If you want to download that and check it out after the event, feel free to do that. I will leave up the, the uh, poll question for everyone to respond to while I announce our final prize winners on the Megacast today. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Josh Koloff from Wisconsin. And our final grand prize for a Microsoft Surface Pro 8, this is going out to Jim Howell from Indiana. Congratulations. I'll post all the prize winners there in the questions pane as well. Doing that now. All right, those are posted. Uh, before you go, I want to remind you to check out the 10 on Tech podcast. It's over there in the iTunes podcast store and other podcast uh, download locations or subscription sites. Um, make sure, you know, if you are a potential sponsor of an upcoming EcoCast or Megacast event, uh, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. Uh, we would love to chat about having you on an upcoming Megacast or EcoCast I hope that you'll join us on our next EcoCast event happening next Wednesday on supporting, securing, and enhancing Microsoft-centric environments. Uh, we'll have seven expert presentations on that event back-to-back, -back, so I hope to see you there again next Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon Eastern. Don't forget, of course, about the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's there in the Handouts tab. If you go there, you can download free educational IT books, learn about some of the most innovative technology solutions available today. And then finally, as soon as we end the event here, you'll be automatically redirected to our Refer a Friend page. This is where you can refer your IT friends or coworkers to Actual Tech Media's online events, and you both could win an Amazon $300 gift card. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us on the Megacast today. I hope that you learned a lot, and I hope that you have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.